Namaste, we are going to understand the book of Gita. The Gita is a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, narrated in the Bhishma Parva, the big day, of the Mahabharata. It comprises 18 discourses of a total of 701 Sanskrit verses. A considerable volume of material has been compressed within these verses. On the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Sri Krishna, during the course of his most instructive and interesting talk with Arjuna, revealed profound, sublime and soul-stirring spiritual truths, and expounded the rare secrets of Yoga, Vedanta, Bhakti and Karma. All the teachings of Krishna were subsequently recorded as the Song Celestial or Gita by Rishivyasa for the benefit of humanity at large. The world is under a great debt of gratitude to Bhagavan Vyasa who presented the Song Celestial to humanity for the guidance of their daily conduct of life, spiritual upliftment, and self-realization. Those who are self-controlled and who are endowed with faith can reap the full benefit of the Gita, which is the science of the soul. The Gita Jayanti, birth date of the Gita, is celebrated throughout India by the admirers and lovers of this unique book on the 11th day, Ikadashi, of the bright half of the month of Margashirsha according to the Hindu almanac. It was the day on which the scripture was revealed to the world by Sanjaya. In all the spiritual literature of the world there is no book so elevating and inspiring as the Gita. It expounds very lucidly the cardinal principles or the fundamentals of the Hindu religion and Hindu dharma. It is the source of all wisdom. It is your great guide. It is your supreme teacher. It is an inexhaustible spiritual treasure. It is a fountain of bliss. It is an ocean of knowledge. It is full of divine splendor and grandeur. The Gita is the cream of the Vedas. It is the essence of the soul elevating Upanishads. It is a universal scripture applicable to people of all temperaments and for all times. It is a wonderful book with sublime thoughts and practical instructions on yoga, devotion, Vedanta, and action. It is a marvelous book, profound in thought and sublime in heights of vision. It brings peace and solace to souls that are afflicted by the three fires of mortal existence, namely, afflictions caused by one's own body, those caused by beings around one, and those caused by the gods. The Gita contains the divine nectar. It is the wish-fulfilling gem, tree, and cow. You can milk anything from it. It is a book for eternity. It is not a catchpenny book, with life like that of a mushroom. It can be one's constant companion of life. It is a Vedmekam for all. Peace, bliss, wisdom, Brahman, Nirvana, Parampadam and Gita are all synonymous terms. The Gita is a boundless ocean of nectar. It is the immortal celestial fruit of the Upanishad tree. In this unique book you will find an unbiased exposition of the philosophy of action, devotion, and knowledge, together with a wonderfully woven synthesis of these three. The Gita is a rare and splendid flower that wafts its sweet aroma throughout the world. If all the Upanishads should represent cows, Sri Krishna is their milker. Arjuna is the calf who first tasted that milk of wisdom of the self, milked by the divine cowherd for the benefit of all humanity. This milk is the Gita. It solves not only Arjuna's problems and doubts, but also the world's problems and those of every individual. Glory to Krishna, the friend of the cowherds of Gokula, the joy of Devki. He who drinks the nectar of the Gita through purification of the heart and regular meditation, attains immortality, eternal bliss, everlasting peace, and perennial joy. There is nothing more to be attained beyond this. Just as the dark unfathomed depths of the ocean contain most precious pearls, so also the Gita contains spiritual gems of incalculable value. You will have to dive deep into its depths with a sincere attitude of reverence and faith. Only then will you be able to collect its spiritual pearls and comprehend its infinitely profound and subtle teachings. The Gita is a unique book for all ages. It is one of the most authoritative books of the Hindu religion. It is the immortal song of the soul, which bespeaks of the glory of life. The instructions given by Sri Krishna are for the whole world. It is a standard book on yoga for all mankind. The language is as simple as could be. Even a man who has an elementary knowledge of Sanskrit can go through the book. The teachings of the Gita are broad, universal, and sublime. 
They do not belong to any cult, sect, creed, age, or country. They are meant for the people of the whole world. Based on the soul elevating Upanishads the ancient wisdom of seers and saints the Gita prescribes methods which are within the reach of all. It has a message of solace, freedom, salvation, perfection, and peace for all human beings. This sacred scripture is like the great Manasaravar lake for monks, renunciates, and thirsting aspirants to sport in. It is the ocean of bliss in which seekers of truth swim with joy and ecstasy. If the philosopher's stone touches a piece of iron even at one point, the whole of it is transformed into gold. Even so, if you live in the spirit of even one verse of the Gita, you will doubtless be transmuted into divinity. All your miseries will come to an end and you will attain the highest goal of life immortality and eternal peace. The study of the Gita alone is sufficient for daily Swadhyaya, scriptural study. You will find here a solution for all your doubts. The more you study it with devotion and faith, the more you will acquire deeper knowledge, penetrative insight, and clear, right thinking. The Gita is a gospel for the whole world. It is meant for the generality of mankind. It was given over 5,000 years ago by Krishna to Arjuna. None but the himself can bring out such a marvelous and unprecedented book which gives peace to its readers, which helps and guides them in the attainment of supreme bliss, and which has survived up to the present time. This itself proves clearly that God exists, that he is an embodiment of knowledge, and that one can attain perfection or liberation only by realizing God. The world is one huge battlefield. The real Kurukshetra is within you. The battle of the Mahabharata is still raging within. Ignorance is Dhritarashtra, the individual soul is Arjuna, the indweller of your heart is Krishna, the charioteer, the body is the chariot, the senses are the five horses, mind, egoism, mental impressions, senses, cravings, likes and dislikes, lust, jealousy, greed, pride and hypocrisy are your dire enemies. The great Mahabharata war between the Pandavas and the Kauravas took place on the holy plain of Kurukshetra. After the failure of Krishna's peace mission when he himself went to Hastinapura as the emissary of the Pandavas, there was no other alternative for the Pandavas but to engage in war for their rightful share of the kingdom. All the famous warriors from both sides had assembled on the battlefield. Tents and wagons, weapons and machines, chariots and animals covered the vast plain. Krishna arrived on the scene in a magnificent chariot yoked by white horses. He was to act as the charioteer of Arjuna, one of the Pandava princes. The din of hundreds of conches, blaring forth suddenly, announced the commencement of the battle. Arjuna blew his conch Devdutta, while Bhima, his brother, sounded the Pandra. All the other great warriors blew their respective conches. As the two armies were arrayed, ready for battle, Arjuna requested Krishna to place his chariot between them so that he might survey his opponents. He was bewildered by the scene before him, for he beheld on both sides, fathers and grandfathers, teachers and uncles, fathers-in-law, grandsons, relatives, and comrades. Confusion reigned in Arjuna's mind. Should he participate in this terrible carnage? Was it proper to destroy one's relatives for the sake of a kingdom and some pleasures? Would it not be much better for him to surrender everything in favor of his enemies and retire in peace? As these thoughts rushed into his mind, a feeling of despondency overtook Arjuna. He had no enthusiasm to engage in this battle. Letting his bow slip from his hands, Arjuna could do nothing but turn to Krishna for guidance and enlightenment. Dhritarashtra said, what did the sons of Pandu and my people do when they had assembled together, eager for battle on the holy plain of Kurukshetra, O Sanjaya? Sanjaya said. Having seen the army of the Pandavas drawn up in battle array, King Duryodhana then approached his teacher, Drona, and spoke these words. Behold, O teacher, this mighty army of the sons of Pandu, arrayed by the son of Drupada, thy wise disciple. Here are heroes, Mighty archers, equal in battle to Bhima and Arjuna, Yuyudhana, Virata, and Drupada, of the great car, mighty warriors, Drishtakatu, Kikaitana, and the valiant king of Kasi, Purujit, 
and Kuntabhoja and Sibiya, the best of men, the strong Yudhamenu and the brave Udamaljas, the son of Subhadra, Abhimanyu, the son of Arjuna, and the sons of Dhrupathi, all of great chariots, great heroes. Dot. Know also, O best among the twice born, the names of those who are the most distinguished amongst ourselves, the leaders of my army. These I name to thee for thy information. Thyself and Bhishma and Karna and Kripa, the victorious in war, Asvatthama, Vikarna and Jayadratha, the son of Somadatta. And also, many other heroes who have given up their lives for my sake, armed with various weapons and missiles, all well skilled in battle. This army of ours marshalled by Bhishma is insufficient, whereas their army, marshalled by Pima, is sufficient. Therefore, do ye all, stationed in your respective positions in the several divisions of the army protect Bhishma alone. His glorious grandsire, Bhishma, the eldest of the Kauravas, to cheer Duryodhana, now roared like a lion and blew his conch. Then, following Bhishma, conches and kettle drums, tabers, drums and cow horns blared forth quite suddenly, from the side of the Kauravas, and the sound was tremendous. Then also, Madhav, Krishna, and the son of Pandu, Arjuna, seated in their magnificent chariot yoked with white horses, blew their divine conches. Hrishiksa blew the Panchajanya and Arjuna blew the Devdutta, and Bhima, the doer of terrible deeds blew the great conch, Pandra. Yudhishthir, the son of Kunthi, blew the Anantavijaya, and Sahadeva and Nikula blew the Manipushpaka and Sugasha conches. The king of Kasi, an excellent archer, Sikh Andi, the mighty car warrior, Dristadiyamna and Virada and Satyaki, the unconquered, Drupada and the sons of Dhrupathi, O lord of the earth, and the son of Subhadra, the mighty armed, all blew their respective conches. The tumultuous sound rent the hearts of Dhritarashtra's party, making both heaven and earth resounds. Then, Seeing all the people of Dhritarashtra's party standing arrayed and the discharge of weapons about to begin, Arjuna, the son of Pandu, whose ensign was that of a monkey, took up his bow and said the following to Krishna, O Lord of the Earth. Arjuna said, In the middle of the two armies, place my chariot, O Krishna, so that I may behold those who stand here, desirous to fight, and know with whom I must fight when the battle begins. For I desire to observe those who are assembled here to fight, wishing to please in battle Duryodhana, the evil-minded. Being thus addressed by Arjuna, Krishna, having stationed that best of chariots, O Dhritarashtra, during the two armies, in front of Bhishma and Drona and all the rulers of the earth, said, O Arjuna, behold now all these Kurus gathered together. Then Arjuna beheld there stationed, grandfathers and fathers, teachers, maternal uncles, brothers, sons, grandsons, and friends, too. Fathers-in-law and friends also in both armies. The son of Kunthi Arjuna seeing all these kinsmen standing arrayed, spoke thus sorrowfully, filled with deep pity. Arjuna said, Seeing these, my kinsmen, O Krishna, arrayed, eager to fight, my limbs fail and my mouth is parched up, my body quivers and my hairs stand on end. The, bow, Gandava slips from my hand and my skin burns all over, I am unable even to stand, my mind is reeling, as it were. And I see adverse omens, O Kesva. I do not see any good in killing my kinsmen in battle. For I desire neither victory, O Krishna, nor pleasures nor kingdoms. Of what avail is a dominion to us, O Krishna? or pleasures or even life. Those for whose sake we desire kingdoms, enjoyments, and pleasures, stand here in battle, having renounced life and wealth. Teachers, fathers, sons, and grandfathers, grandsons, fathers-in-law, maternal uncles, brothers-in-law, and relatives. These I do not wish to kill, though they kill me, O Krishna, even for the sake of dominion over the three worlds, leave alone killing them for the sake of the earth. By killing these sons of Dhritarashtra, what pleasure can be ours, O Janardana? Only sin will accrue by killing these felons. Therefore, we should not kill the sons of Dhritarashtra, our relatives, for, 
how can we be happy by killing our own people, O Madhav, Krishna? Though they, with intelligence overpowered by greed, see no evil in the destruction of families, and no sin in hostility to friends, why should not we, who clearly see evil in the destruction of a family, learn to turn away from this sin, O Janardana, Krishna? Ignorance of the law is no excuse and wanton sinful conduct is a crime unworthy of knowledgeable people. In the destruction of a family, the immemorial religious rights of that family perish, on the destruction of spirituality, impiety overcomes the whole family. Dharma pertains to the duties and ceremonies practiced by the family in accordance with scriptural injunctions. By prevalence of impiety, O Krishna, the women of the family become corrupt and, women becoming corrupted, O Varsnya, descendant of Vrishni, there arises intermingling of castes. Confusion of castes leads to hell the slayers of the family, for their forefathers fall, deprived of the offerings of rice ball and water. By these evil deeds of the destroyers of the family, which cause confusion of castes, the eternal religious rights of the caste and the family are destroyed. We have heard, O Janardana, that inevitable is the dwelling for an unknown period in hell for those men in whose families the religious practices have been destroyed. Alas! We are involved in a great sin in that we are prepared to kill our kinsmen through greed for the pleasures of a kingdom. If the sons of Dhritarashtra, with weapons in hand, should slay me in battle, unresisting and unarmed, that would be better for me. Sanjaya said, having thus spoken during the battlefield, Arjuna, casting away his bow and arrow, sat down on the seat of the chariot with his mind overwhelmed with sorrow. Thus in the Upanishads of the glorious Gita, the science of the eternal, the scripture of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna, ends the first discourse entitled. Sanjaya said, to him who was thus overcome with pity and who was despondent, with eyes full of tears and agitated, Krishna or Madhusudana, the destroyer of Madhu, spoke these words. Whence is this perilous strait come upon thee, this dejection which is unworthy of thee, disgraceful, and which will close the gates of heaven upon thee, O Arjuna? Yield not to impotence, O Arjuna, son of Parita. It does not befit thee. Cast off this mean weakness of the heart. Stand up, O scorcher of foes. How, O Madhusudana, shall I fight in battle with arrows against Bhishma and Drona, who are fit to be worshipped, O destroyer of enemies? Better it is, indeed, in this world to accept alms than to slay the most noble teachers. But if I kill them, even in this world all my enjoyments of wealth and desires will be stained with, their, blood. I can hardly tell which will be better, that we should conquer them, or they should conquer us. Even the sons of Dhritarashtra, after slaying whom we do not wish to live, stand facing us. My heart is overpowered by the taint of pity, my mind is confused as to duty. I ask thee, tell me decisively what is good for me. I am thy disciple. Instruct me who has taken refuge in thee. I do not see that it would remove the sorrow that burns up my senses even if I should attain prosperous and unrivaled dominion on earth or ship over the gods. Sanjaya said, having spoken thus to Hrishiksa, of the senses, Arjuna, the conqueror of sleep, the destroyer of foes, said to Krishna, I will not fight, and became silent. To him who was despondent in the midst of the two armies, Sri Krishna, as if smiling, O Bharata, spoke these words. Krishna said, Thou hast grieved for those that should not be grieved for, yet thou speaks the words of wisdom. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. Nor at any time indeed was I not, nor these rulers of men, nor verily shall we ever cease to be hereafter. Just as in this body the embodied, soul, passes into childhood, youth, and old age, so also does he pass into another body, the firm man does not grieve thereat. The contacts of the senses with the objects, O son of Kunthi, which cause heat and cold and pleasure and pain, have a beginning and an end, they are impermanent, endure them bravely, O Arjuna. That firm man whom surely these afflict not, O chief among men, to whom pleasure and pain is the same, is fit for attaining immortality. 
the unreal hath no being, there is no non-being of the real, the truth about both has been seen by the knowers of the truth, or the seers of the essence. What is changing must always be unreal. What is constant or permanent must always be real. The Atman or the Eternal, all-pervading self ever exists. It is the only reality. This phenomenal world of names and forms is ever-changing. Names and forms are subject to decay and death. Hence, they are unreal or impermanent. Know that to be indestructible, by whom all this is pervaded. None can cause the destruction of that, the imperishable. The self pervades all objects like ether. Even if the pot is broken, the ether that is within and without it cannot be destroyed. Similarly, if the bodies and all other objects perish, the eternal self that pervades them cannot be destroyed, it is the living truth. These bodies of the embodied self, which is eternal, indestructible, and immeasurable, are said to have an end. Therefore, fight, O Arjuna. He who takes the self to be the slayer and he who thinks he is slain, neither of them knows, he slays not nor is he slain. He is not born nor does he ever die, after having been, he again ceases not to be. Unborn, eternal, changeless, and ancient, he is not killed when the body is killed, whosoever knows him to be indestructible, eternal, unborn, and inexhaustible, how can that man slays, O Arjuna, or cause to be slain? Just as a man casts off worn-out clothes and puts on new ones, so also the embodied self casts off worn-out bodies and enters others that are new. Weapons cut it not, fire burns it not, water wets it not, wind dries it not. The self is partless. It is infinite and extremely subtle. So, the sword cannot cut it, fire cannot burn it, wind cannot dry it. This self cannot be cut, burnt wetted nor dried up. It is eternal, all-pervading, stable, ancient, and immovable. This, self, is said to be unmanifested, unthinkable, and unchangeable. Therefore, knowing this to be such, thou should not grieve. But, even if thou think of it as being constantly born and dying, even then, O mighty armed, thou should not grieve. Birth is inevitable to what is dead and death is inevitable to what is born. This is the law of nature. Therefore, one should not grieve. For, certain is death for the born and certain is birth for the dead, therefore, over the inevitable thou should not grieve. Beings are unmanifested in their beginning, manifested in their middle state, O Arjuna, and unmanifested again in their end. What is there to grieve about? The physical body is a combination of the five elements. It is perceived by the physical eye only after the five elements have entered such combination. After death the body disintegrates and all the five elements return to their source. The body cannot be perceived now. It can be perceived only in the middle state. He who understands the nature of the body and human relationships based upon it will not grieve. One sees this, the self, as a wonder, another speaks of it as a wonder, another hears of it as a wonder, Yet, having heard, none understands it at all. The verse may also be interpreted in this manner, he that sees, hears, and speaks of the self is a wonderful man. Such a man is very rare. He is one among many thousands. Therefore, the self is very hard to understand. This, the indweller in the body of everyone, is always indestructible, O Arjuna. Therefore, thou should not grieve for any creature. Further, having regard to thy own duty, thou should not waver, for there is nothing higher for a Kshatriya than a righteous war. To a Kshatriya, one born in the warrior or ruling class, nothing is more welcome than a righteous war. Happy are the Kshatriyas, O Arjuna, who are called upon to fight in such a battle that comes of itself as an open door to heaven. The scriptures declare that if a warrior dies for a righteous cause on the battlefield he at once ascends to heaven. But, if thou wilt not fight in this righteous war, then, having abandoned thine duty and fame, thou shalt incur sin. People, too, will recount thy everlasting disianur, and to one who has been honored, disianur is worse than death. 
the great car warriors will think that thou hast withdrawn from the battle through fear, and thou wilt be lightly held by them who have thought much of thee. Thy enemies also, cavilling at thy power, will speak many abusive words. What is more painful than this? Slain, thou wilt obtain heaven, victorious, thou wilt enjoy the earth, therefore, stand up, O son of Kunthi, resolved to fight. Having made pleasure and pain, gain and loss, victory and defeat the same, engage thou in battle for the sake of battle, thus thou shalt not incur sin. This is the yoga of equanimity or the doctrine of poise in action. If a person performs actions with the above mental attitude, he will not reap the fruits of such actions. This which has been taught to thee, is wisdom concerning Sankhya. Now listen to wisdom concerning yoga, endowed with which, O Arjuna, thou shalt cast off the bonds of action. In this there is no loss of effort, nor is there any harm, the production of contrary results or transgression. Even a little of this knowledge, even a little practice of this yoga, protects one from great fear. In karma yoga, selfless action, even a little effort brings immediate purification of the heart. Purification of the heart leads to fearlessness. Here, O joy of the Kurus, there is a single one-pointed determination. Many branched and endless are the thoughts of the irresolute. Flowery speech is uttered by the unwise, who take pleasure in the eulogizing words of the Vedas, O Arjuna, saying, There is nothing else. Full of desires, having heaven as their goal, they utter speech which promises birth as the reward of one's actions, and prescribe various specific actions for the attainment of pleasure and power. For those who are much attached to pleasure and to power, whose minds are drawn away by such teaching, that determinate faculty is not manifest that is steadily bent on meditation and samadhi, the state of super-consciousness. The Vedas deal with the three attributes, of nature, be thou above these three attributes, O Arjuna. Free yourself from the pairs of opposites and ever remain in the quality of sattva, goodness, freed from the thought of acquisition and preservation, and be established in the self. Guna means attribute or quality. It is substance as well as quality. Nature is made up of three guna sattva, purity, light, harmony, rajas, passion, restlessness, motion, and tamas, inertia, darkness. The pairs of opposites are pleasure and pain, heat and cold, gain and loss, victory and defeat, honor and disianur, praise and censure. To the Brahmana who has known the self, all the Vedas are of as much use as is a reservoir of water in a place where there is a flood. Thy right is to work only, but never with its fruits, let not the fruits of actions be thy motive, nor let thy attachment be to inaction. Perform action, O Arjuna, being steadfast in yoga, abandoning attachment, and balanced in success and failure. Evenness of mind is called yoga. Far lower than the yoga of wisdom is action, O Arjuna. Seek thou refuge in wisdom. Wretched are they whose motive is the fruit. Endowed with wisdom, evenness of mind, one casts off in this life both good and evil deeds, therefore, devote thyself to yoga, yoga is skill in action. The wise, possessed of knowledge, having abandoned the fruits of their actions, and being freed from the fetters of birth, go to the place which is beyond all evil. When thy intellect crosses beyond the mire of delusion, then thou shalt attain to indifference as to what has been heard and what has yet to be heard. When thy intellect, perplexed by what thou hast heard, shall stand immovable and steady in the self, then thou shalt attain self-realization. What, O Krishna, is the description of him who has steady wisdom and is merged in the superconscious state. How does one of steady wisdom speak? How does he sit? How does he walk? Krishna said, when a man completely casts off, O Arjuna, all the desires of the mind and is satisfied in the self by the self, then is he said to be one of steady wisdom. He whose mind is not shaken by adversity, who does not hanker after pleasures, and who is free from attachment, fear, and anger, is called a sage of steady wisdom. He who is everywhere without attachment, on meeting with anything good or bad, who neither rejoices nor hates, his wisdom is fixed. 
when, like the tortoise which withdraws its limbs on all sides, he withdraws his senses from the sense objects, then his wisdom becomes steady. The objects of the senses turn away from the abstinent man, leaving the longing, behind, but his longing also turns away on seeing the Supreme. The turbulent senses, O Arjuna, do violently carry away the mind of a wise man though he strives. Having restrained them all he should sit steadfast, intent on me, his wisdom is steady whose senses are under control. When a man thinks of the objects, attachment to them arises, from attachment desire is born, from desire anger arises. From anger comes delusion, from delusion the loss of memory, from loss of memory the destruction of discrimination, from the destruction of discrimination, he perishes. But the self-controlled man, moving amongst objects with the senses under restraint, and free from attraction and repulsion, attains to peace. In that peace all pains are destroyed, for the intellect of the tranquil-minded soon becomes steady. There is no knowledge of the self to the unsteady, and to the unsteady no meditation is possible, and to the unmeditative there can be no peace, and to the man who has no peace, how can there be happiness? For the mind which follows in the wake of the wandering senses, carries away his discrimination as the wind, carries away, a boat on the waters. Therefore, O mighty armed Arjuna, his knowledge is steady whose senses are completely restrained from sense objects. That which is night to all beings, then the self-controlled man is awake, when all beings are awake, that is night for the sage who sees. He attains peace into whom all desires enter as waters enter the ocean, which, filled from all sides remains unmoved, but not the man who is full of desires. The man attains peace, who, abandoning all desires, moves about without longing, without the sense of mind and without egoism. This is the Brahmic seat, eternal state, O son of Parita. Attaining to this, none is deluded. Being established therein, even at the end of life one attains to oneness with Brahman. In order to remove moha or attachment, which was the sole cause of Arjuna's delusion, Sri Krishna taught him the imperishable nature of the Atman, the realization of which would grant him the freedom of the eternal. A doubt therefore arises in Arjuna's mind as to the necessity of engaging in action even after one has attained this state. Krishna clears this doubt by telling him that although one has realized oneness with the eternal, one has to perform action through the force of property or nature. He emphasizes that perfection is attained not by ceasing to engage in action but by doing all actions as a divine offering, imbued with a spirit of non-attachment and sacrifice. The man of God vision, Krishna explains to Arjuna, need not engage in action, as he has attained everything that has to be attained. He can be ever absorbed in the calm and immutable self. But to perform action for the good of the world and for the education of the masses is no doubt superior. Therefore, action is necessary not only for one who has attained perfection but also for one who is striving for perfection. Sri Krishna quotes the example of Janaka, the great sage king of India, who continued to rule his kingdom even after attaining God realization. Property or nature is made up of the three qualities Rajas, Tamas, and Satwa. The Atman is beyond these three qualities and their functions. Only when knowledge of this fact dawns in man does he attain perfection. Krishna tells Arjuna that each one should do his duty according to his nature, and that doing duty that is suited to one's nature in the right spirit of detachment will lead to perfection. Arjuna raises the question as to why man commits such actions that cloud his mind and drag him downwards, by force, as it were. Krishna answers that it is desire that impels man to lose his discrimination and understanding, and thus commit wrong actions. Desire is the root cause of all evil actions. If desire is removed, then the divine power manifests in its full glory and one enjoys peace, bliss, light, and freedom. Arjuna said, If it be thought by thee that knowledge is superior to action, O Krishna, why then, thou ask me to engage in this terrible action? With these apparently perplexing words thou confusest, as it were, my understanding, therefore, tell me that one way for certain by which I may attain bliss. Krishna said, in this world there is a twofold path, as I said before, 
O sinless one the path of knowledge of the Sankhyas and the path of action of the yogis. Not by the non-performance of actions does man reach motionlessness, nor by mere renunciation does he attain to perfection. Even if a man abandons action, his mind may be active. One cannot reach perfection or freedom from action or knowledge of the self, merely by renouncing action. He must possess knowledge of the self. Verily none can ever remain for even a moment without performing action, for, everyone is made to act helplessly indeed by the qualities born of nature. The ignorant man is driven to action helplessly by the actions of the Gunas Rajas, Tamas, and Satwe. He who, restraining the organs of action, sits thinking of the sense objects in mind, he, of deluded understanding, is called a hypocrite. But whosoever, controlling the senses by the mind, O Arjuna, engages himself in karma yoga with the organs of action, without attachment, he excels. Do thou perform thy bounden duty, for action is superior to inaction and even the maintenance of the body would not be possible for thee by inaction. The world is bound by actions other than those performed for the sake of sacrifice, do thou, therefore, O son of Kunthi, perform action for that sake, for sacrifice, alone, free from attachment. If anyone does actions for the sake of the Lord, he is not bound. His heart is purified by performing actions for the sake of the Lord. Where this spirit of unselfishness does not govern the action, such actions bind one to worldliness, however good or glorious they may be. The Creator, having in the beginning of creation created mankind together with sacrifice, said, By this shall yet propagate, let this be the milch cow of your desires, the cow which yields the desired objects. With this do ye nourish the gods, and may the gods nourish you, thus nourishing one another, ye shall attain to the highest good. The gods, nourished by the sacrifice, will give you the desired objects. So, he who enjoys the objects given by the gods without offering, in return, to them, is verily a thief. The righteous, who eat of the remnants of the sacrifice, are freed from all sins, but those sinful ones who cook food, only, for their own sake, verily eat sin. From food come forth beings, and from rain food is produced, from sacrifice arises rain, and sacrifice is born of action. Know thou that action comes from Brahma, and Brahma proceeds from the imperishable. Therefore, the all-pervading, Brahma, ever rests in sacrifice. He who does not follow the will thus set revolving, who is of sinful life, rejoicing in the senses, he lives in vain, O Arjuna. But for that man who rejoices only in the self, who is satisfied in the self, who is content in the self alone, verily there is nothing to do. For him there is no interest whatsoever in what is done or what is not done, nor does he depend on any being for any object. Therefore, without attachment, do thou always perform action which should be done, for, by performing action without attachment man reaches the Supreme. Janaka and others attained perfection verily by action only, even with a view to the protection of the masses thou shouldst perform action. Whatsoever a great man does, that other men also do, whatever he sets up as the standard, that the world follows. There is nothing in the three worlds, O Arjuna, that should be done by me, nor is there anything unattained that should be attained, yet I engage myself in action. For, should I not ever engage myself in action, unwearied, men would in every way follow my path, O Arjuna. These worlds would perish if I did not perform action, I should be the author of confusion of castes and destruction of these beings. As the ignorant men act from attachment to action, O Arjuna, so should the wise act without attachment, wishing the welfare of the world. Let no wise man unsettle the minds of ignorant people who are attached to action, he should engage them in all actions, himself fulfilling them with devotion. All actions are wrought in all cases by the qualities of nature only. He whose mind is deluded by egoism thinks, I am the doer. Property or nature is that state in which the three gunas exist in a state of equilibrium. When this equilibrium is disturbed, creation begins, and the body, senses and mind are formed. 
The man who is deluded by egoism identifies the self with the body, mind, the life force and the senses, and ascribes to the self all the attributes of the body and the senses. In reality the gunas of nature perform all actions. But he who knows the truth, O mighty armed Arjuna, about the divisions of the qualities and their functions, knowing that the gunas as senses move amidst the gunas as the sense objects, is not attached. Those deluded by the qualities of nature are attached to the functions of the qualities. A man of perfect knowledge should not unsettle the foolish one of imperfect knowledge. Renouncing all actions in me, with the mind centered in the self, free from hope and egoism, and from, mental, fever, do thou fight. Those men who constantly practice this teaching of mine with faith and without caviling, they too are freed from actions. But those who carp at my teaching and do not practice it, deluded in all knowledge and devoid of discrimination, know them to be doomed to destruction. Even a wise man acts in accordance with his own nature, beings will follow nature, what can restraint do? Attachment and aversion for the objects of the senses abide in the senses, let none come under their sway, for they are his foes. Better is one's own duty, though devoid of merit, than the duty of another well discharged. Better is death in one's own duty, the duty of another is fraught with fear. Arjuna said, but impelled by what does man commit sin, though against his wishes, O Krishna, constrained, as it were, by force? Krishna said, it is desire, it is anger born of the quality of rajas, all sinful and all devouring, know this as the foe here, in this world. As fire is enveloped by smoke, as a mirror by dust, and as an embryo by the amnion, so is this is enveloped by that. O Arjuna, wisdom is enveloped by this constant enemy of the wise in the form of desire, which is unappeasable as fire. The senses, mind, and intellect are said to be its seat, through these it deludes the embodied by veiling his wisdom. Therefore, O Arjuna, controlling the senses first, do thou kill this sinful thing, desire, the destroyer of knowledge and realization. They say that the senses are superior, to the body, superior to the senses is the mind, superior to the mind is the intellect, and one who is superior even to the intellect is he the self. Thus, knowing him who is superior to the intellect and restraining the self by the self, slay thou, O mighty armed Arjuna, the enemy in the form of desire, hard to conquer. One who has true union with the Lord is not subject to rebirth. He attains immortality. Such a union can only be achieved when one is free from attachment, fear, and anger, being thoroughly purified by right knowledge. The Lord accepts the devotion of all, whatever path they may use to approach Him. Various kinds of sacrifices are performed by those engaged in the path to God. Through the practice of these sacrifices the mind is purified and led Godward. Here also there must be the spirit of non-attachment to the fruits of actions. Divine wisdom, according to Krishna, should be sought at the feet of a liberated guru, one who has realized the truth. The aspirant should approach such a sage in a spirit of humility and devotion. God himself manifests in the heart of the guru and instructs the disciple. Having understood the truth from the guru by direct intuitive experience the aspirant is no longer deluded by ignorance. Arjuna is given the most heartening assurance that divine wisdom liberates even the most sinful. When knowledge of the self dawns, all actions with their results are burnt by the fire of that knowledge, just as fuel is burnt by fire. When there is no idea of egoism, when there is no desire for the fruits of one's actions, actions are no actions. They lose their potency. In order to attain divine wisdom one must have supreme faith and devotion. Faith is therefore the most important qualification for a spiritual aspirant. The doubting mind is always led astray from the right path. Faith ultimately confers divine knowledge, which removes ignorance once and for all. The Krishna concludes by emphasizing that the soul that doubts goes to destruction. Without faith in oneself, in the scriptures and in the words of the preceptor, one cannot make any headway on the spiritual path. It is doubt that prevents one from engaging in spiritual sadhana and realizing the highest knowledge and bliss. By following the instructions of the Guru and through sincere service, 
one's doubts are rent asunder and divine knowledge manifests itself within. Spiritual progress then goes on at a rapid pace. Krishna said, I taught this imperishable yoga to Vivasvan, he told it to Manu, Manu proclaimed it to Ikshvaku. This, handed down thus in regular succession, the royal sages knew. This yoga, by a long lapse of time, has been lost here. That same ancient yoga has been today taught to thee by me, for, thou art my devotee and friend, it is the supreme secret. Arjuna said, later on was thy birth, and prior to it was the birth of Vivasvan, the son, how am I to understand that thou didst teach this yoga in the beginning? Krishna said, many births of mine have passed, as well as of thine, O Arjuna. I know them all but thou knowest not. Though I am unborn and of imperishable nature, and though I am the lord of all beings, yet, ruling over my own nature, I am born by my own maya. Whenever there is a decline of righteousness, O Arjuna, and rise of unrighteousness, then I manifest myself. For the protection of the good, for the destruction of the wicked, and for the establishment of righteousness, I am born in every age. He who thus knows in true light my divine birth and action, after having abandoned the body is not born again, he comes to me, O Arjuna. Freed from attachment, fear, and anger, absorbed in me, taking refuge in me, purified by the fire of knowledge, many have attained to my being. In whatever way men approach me, even so do I reward them, my path do men tread in all ways, O Arjuna. Those who long for success in action in this world sacrifice to the gods, because success is quickly attained by men through action. The fourfold caste has been created by me according to the differentiation of guna and karma, though I am the author thereof, know me as the non-doer and immutable. In a Brahmana, Satwe predominates. He possesses serenity, purity, self-restraint, straightforwardness and devotion. In a Kshatriya, Rajas predominates. He possesses prowess, splendor, firmness, dexterity, generosity, and rulership. In a Vaishya, Rajas predominate and Tamas are subordinate to Rajas. He does the duty of plowing, protection of cattle and trade. In a Sudra, Tamas predominate and Rajas are subordinate to the quality of Tamas. He renders service to the other three castes. Human temperaments and tendencies vary according to the Gunas. Actions do not taint me, nor have I a desire for the fruits of actions. He who knows me thus is not bound by actions. Having known this, the ancient seekers after freedom also performed actions, therefore, do thou perform actions as did the ancients in days of yore. What is action? What is inaction? As to this even the wise are confused. Therefore, I shall teach thee such action, the nature of action and inaction, by knowing which thou shalt be liberated from the evil, of samsara, the world of birth and death. For, verily the true nature of action, enjoined by the scriptures, should be known, also, that, of forbidden, or unlawful, action, and of inaction, hard to understand is the nature, path, of action. He who seeth inaction in action and action in inaction, he is wise among men, he is a yogi and performer of all actions. He whose undertakings are all devoid of desires and, selfish, purposes, and whose actions have been burnt by the fire of knowledge him the wise call a sage. Having abandoned attachment to the fruit of the action, ever content, depending on nothing, he does not do anything though engaged in activity. Without hope and with the mind and the self-controlled, having abandoned all greed, doing mere bodily action, he incurs no sin. Content with what comes to him without effort, free from the peers of opposites and envy, even-minded in success and failure, though acting, he is not bound. To one who is devoid of attachment, who is liberated, whose mind is established in knowledge, who works for the sake of sacrifice, for the sake of God, the whole action is dissolved. Brahman is the ablation, Brahman is the melted butter, ghee, by Brahman is the ablation poured into the fire of Brahman, Brahman verily shall be reached by him who always sees Brahman in action. Some yogis perform sacrifice to the gods alone, while others, 
who have realized the Self, offer the Self as sacrifice by the Self in the fire of Brahman alone. Some again offer hearing and other senses as sacrifice in the fire of restraint, others offer sound and various objects of the senses as sacrifice in the fire of the senses. Others again sacrifice all the functions of the senses and those of the breath, vital energy or prana, in the fire of the yoga of self-restraint kindled by knowledge. Some again offer wealth, austerity and yoga as sacrifice, while the ascetics of self-restraint and rigid vows offer study of scriptures and knowledge as sacrifice. Others offer as sacrifice the outgoing breath in the incoming, and the incoming in the outgoing, restraining the courses of the outgoing and the incoming breaths, solely absorbed in the restraint of the breath. Some yogis practice inhalation, some practice exhalation, and some retention of breath. This is pranayama. Others who regulate their diet offer life breaths in life breaths, all these are knowers of sacrifice, whose sins are all destroyed by sacrifice. Those who eat the remnants of the sacrifice, which are like nectar, go to the eternal Brahman. This world is not for the man who does not perform sacrifice, how then can he have the other, O Arjuna? Thus, various kinds of sacrifices are spread out before Brahman, literally at the mouth or face of Brahman. Know them all as born of action, and knowing thus, thou shalt be liberated. Superior is wisdom sacrifice to sacrifice with objects, O Arjuna. All actions in their entirety, culminate in knowledge. Know that by long prostration, by question, and by service, the wise who have realized the truth will instruct thee in, that, knowledge. Knowing that, thou shalt not, O Arjuna, again become deluded like this, and by that thou shalt see all beings in thyself and also in me. Even if thou art the most sinful of all sinners, yet thou shalt verily cross all sins by the raft of knowledge. One can overcome sin through self-knowledge. As the blazing fire reduces fuel to ashes, O Arjuna, so does the fire of knowledge reduce all actions to ashes. Verily there is no purifier in this world like knowledge. He who is perfected in yoga finds it in the self in time. The man who is full of faith, who is devoted to it, and who has subdued all the senses, obtains, this, knowledge, and, having obtained the knowledge, he goes at once to the supreme peace. The ignorant, the faithless, the doubting self proceeds to destruction, there is neither this world nor the other nor happiness for the doubting. He who has renounced actions by yoga, whose doubts are rent asunder by knowledge, and who is self-possessed actions do not bind him, O Arjuna. Therefore, with the sword of knowledge, of the self, cut asunder the doubt of the self born of ignorance, residing in thy heart, and take refuge in yoga, arise, O Arjuna. In spite of, Krishna's clear instructions, Arjuna still seems to be bewildered. He wants to know conclusively which is superior, the path of action or the path of renunciation of action. The Lord says that both the paths lead to the highest goal of God realization. In both cases the final realization of the Atman is the aim, but the path of Karma Yoga is superior. Actually, there is no real difference between the two. Krishna further asserts that perfection can be attained and one can be established in the Atman only after the mind has been purified through the performance of selfless action. The karma yogi who is aware of the Atman and who is constantly engaged in action knows that although the intellect, mind, and senses are active, he does not do anything. He is a spectator of everything. He dedicates all his actions to the Lord and thus abandons attachment, ever remaining pure and unaffected. He surrenders himself completely to the divine Shakti. Having completely rooted out all desires, attachments, and the ego, he is not born again. The sage who has realized Brahman and is always absorbed in it does not have any rebirth. Such a sage sees Brahman within and without within as the static and transcendent Brahman, and without as the entire universe. He sees the one self in all beings and creatures in a cow, an elephant, and even in a dog and an outcast. He is ever free from joy and grief and enjoys eternal peace and happiness. He does not depend upon the senses for his satisfaction. On the other hand, the enjoyments of the senses are generators of pain. They are impermanent. 
Krishna reminds Arjuna that desire is the main cause of pain and suffering. It is the cause of anger. Therefore, the aspirant should try to eradicate desire and anger if he is to reach the Supreme. Krishna concludes by describing how to control the senses, mind, and intellect by concentrating between the eyebrows and practicing pranayama. One who has achieved perfect control of the outgoing senses and is freed from desire, anger, and fear attains liberation and enjoys perfect peace. Arjuna said, Renunciation of actions, O Krishna, thou praisest, and again yoga. Tell me conclusively which is the better of the two. Krishna said, Renunciation and the yoga of action both lead to the highest bliss, but of the two, the yoga of action is superior to the renunciation of action. He should be known as a perpetual sannyasin who neither hates nor desires, for, free from the pairs of opposites, O mighty armed Arjuna, he is easily set free from bondage. A man does not become a sannyasin by merely giving up actions due to laziness, ignorance, some family quarrel or calamity or unemployment. A true sannyasin is one who has neither attachment nor aversion to anything. Physical renunciation of objects is no renunciation at all. What is wanted is the renunciation of egoism and desires. Children, not the wise, speak of knowledge and the yoga of action or the performance of action as though they are distinct and different, he who is truly established in one obtains the fruits of both. That place which is reached by the Sankhyas or the Jainanis is reached by the karma, yogis. He sees who sees knowledge and the performance of action, karma yoga, as one. But renunciation, O oh mighty armed Arjuna, is hard to attain without yoga, the yoga harmonist sage proceeds quickly to Brahman. He who is devoted to the path of action, whose mind is quite pure, who has conquered the self, who has subdued his senses and who has realized his self as the self in all beings, though acting, he is not tainted. I do nothing at all thus will the harmonist knower of truth think seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, going, sleeping, breathing, speaking, letting go, seizing, opening and closing the eyes convinced that the senses move among the sense objects. The liberated sage always remains as a witness of the activities of the senses as he identifies himself with the self. He who performs actions, offering them to Brahman and abandoning attachment, is not tainted by sin as a lotus leaf by water. Yogis, having abandoned attachment, perform actions only by the body, mind, intellect, and also by the senses, for the purification of the self. The united one, the well-poised or the harmonist, having abandoned the fruit of action, attains to the eternal peace, the non-united only, the unsteady or the unbalanced, impelled by desire and attached to the fruit, is bound. Mentally renouncing all actions and self-controlled, the embodied one rests happily in the non-gated city, neither acting, nor causing others, body and senses, to act. Neither agency nor actions does the Lord create for the world, nor union with the fruits of actions, it is nature that acts. The Lord accepts neither the demerit nor even the merit of any, knowledge is enveloped by ignorance, thereby beings are deluded. But, to those whose ignorance is destroyed by knowledge of the self, like the sun, knowledge reveals the supreme, Brahman. Their intellect absorbed in that, their self being that, established in that, with that as their supreme goal, they go whence there is no return, their sins dispelled by knowledge. Sages look with an equal eye on a Brahmin endowed with learning and humility, on a cow, on an elephant, and even on a dog and an outcast. Even here, in this world, birth, everything, is overcome by those whose minds rest in equality, Brahman is spotless indeed and equal, therefore, they are established in Brahman. Resting in Brahman, with steady intellect, undelude, the knower of Brahman neither rejoiced on obtaining what is pleasant nor grieved on obtaining what is unpleasant. With the self unattached to the external contacts, he discovers happiness in the self, with the self engaged in the meditation of Brahman he attains to the endless happiness. The enjoyments that are born of contacts are generators of pain only, for they have a beginning and an end, O Arjuna. The wise do not rejoice in them. He who is able, 
while still here in this world to withstand, before the liberation from the body, the impulse born of desire and anger he is a yogi, he is a happy man. He who is ever happy within, who rejoices within, who is illumined within, such a yogi attains absolute freedom or moksha, himself becoming Brahman. The sages obtain absolute freedom or moksha they whose sins have been destroyed, whose dualities, perception of dualities or experience of the pairs of opposites, are torn asunder, who are self-controlled, and intent on the welfare of all beings. Absolute freedom, or Brahmic bliss, exists on all sides for those self-controlled ascetics who are free from desire and anger, who have controlled their thoughts and who have realized the self. Shutting out, all, external contacts and fixing the gaze between the eyebrows, equalizing the outgoing and incoming breaths moving within the nostrils, with the senses, the mind and the intellect always controlled, having liberation as his supreme goal, free from desire, fear and anger the sage is verily liberated forever. He who knows me as the enjoyer of sacrifices and austerities, the great lord of all the worlds and the friend of all beings, attains to peace. Krishna emphasizes once again that the yogi or sannyasin is one who has renounced the fruits of actions, not the actions themselves. The performance of actions without an eye on their fruits brings about the purification of the mind. Only a purified mind, a mind free from desires, can engage itself in constant meditation on the Atman. Desire gives rise to imagination or sankalpa, which drives the soul into the field of action. Therefore, none can realize permanent freedom and tranquility of mind without renouncing desires. The lower self must be controlled by the higher self. All the lower impulses of the body, mind, and senses must be controlled by the power of the higher self. Then the higher self becomes one's friend. He who has perfect control of the body, mind, and senses and is united with God, sees God in all objects and beings. He sees inwardly that there is no difference between gold and stone, between friends and enemies, between the righteous and the unrighteous. He is perfectly harmonized. The practice of Brahmakarya is absolutely necessary if one is to succeed in meditation. The conservation and transformation of the vital fluid into spiritual energy gives immense power of concentration. Fearlessness, too, is an essential quality on the Godward path. It is faith in the sustaining protection and grace of God. Arjuna wishes to know the fate of the aspirant who fails to realize the Supreme in spite of his faith and sincerity. Krishna tells him that the accumulated power of his yogic practices will assure him a better birth in the future, with more favorable conditions for sadhana. The aspirant will then be compelled to carry on his yogic practices with greater vigor and faith and will finally achieve God-realization. Krishna concludes that the yogi one who has attained union with the Supreme Lord is superior to the ascetics, to the men of book knowledge and the men of action, as the latter have not transcended ignorance and merged in the self. Krishna said, he who performs his bounden duty without depending on the fruits of his actions he is a sannyasin and a yogi, not he who is without fire and without action. Do thou, O Arjuna, know yoga to be that which they call renunciation, no one verily becomes a yogi who has not renounced thoughts. Krishna eulogizes karma yoga here because it is a means or a stepping stone to the yoga of meditation. In order to encourage the practice of karma yoga it is stated here that it is sannyasa. For a sage who wishes to attain to yoga, action is said to be the means, for the same sage who has attained to yoga, inaction, quiescence, is said to be the means. When a man is not attached to the sense objects or to actions, having renounced all thoughts, then he is said to have attained to yoga. Let a man lift himself by his own self alone, let him not lower himself, for this self alone is the friend of oneself and this self alone is the enemy of oneself. The self is the friend of the self for him who has conquered himself by the self, but to the unconquered self, this self stands in the position of an enemy like the, external, foe. The supreme self of him who is self-controlled and peaceful is balanced in cold and heat, pleasure and pain, as also in honor and disanur. The yogi who is satisfied with the knowledge and the wisdom, of the self, who has conquered the senses, and to whom a clod of earth, a piece of stone and gold are the same, 
is said to be harmonized, that is, is said to have attained the state of nirvikalpa samadhi. He who is of the same mind to the good-hearted, friends, enemies, the indifferent, the neutral, the hateful, the relatives, the righteous and the unrighteous, excels. Let the yogi try constantly to keep the mind steady, remaining in solitude, alone, with the mind and the body controlled, and free from hope and greed. In a clean spot, having established a firm seat of his own, neither too high nor too low, made of a cloth, a skin, and kasha grass, one over the other. There, having made the mind one-pointed, with the actions of the mind and the senses controlled, let him, seated on the seat, practice yoga for the purification of the self. Let him firmly hold his body, head, and neck erect and perfectly still, gazing at the tip of his nose, without looking around. Serene-minded, fearless, firm in the vow of a brahmachari, having controlled the mind, thinking of me and balanced in mind, let him sit, having me as his supreme goal. Thus, always keeping the mind balanced, the yogi, with the mind controlled, attains to the peace abiding in me, which culminates in liberation. Verily yoga is not possible for him who eats too much, nor for him who does not eat at all, nor for him who sleeps too much, nor for him who is, always, awake, O Arjuna. Yoga becomes the destroyer of pain for him who is always moderate in eating and recreation, such as walking, etc., who is moderate in exertion in actions, who is moderate in sleep and wakefulness. When the perfectly controlled mind rests in the self only, free from longing for the objects of desire, then it is said, he is united. Without union with the self neither harmony nor balance nor samadhi is possible. As a lamp placed in a windless spot does not flicker to such as compared the yogi of controlled mind, practicing yoga in the self, or absorbed in the yoga of the self. This is a beautiful simile which yogis often quote when they talk of concentration or one-pointedness of mind. When the mind, restrained by the practice of yoga, attains to quietude, and when, seeing the self by the self, he is satisfied in his own self. When he, the yogi, feels that infinite bliss which can be grasped by the pure intellect and which transcends the senses, and established wherein he never moves from the reality, which, having obtained, he thinks there is no other gain superior to it, wherein established, he is not moved even by heavy sorrow. Let that be known by the name of yoga, the severance from union with pain. This yoga should be practiced with determination and with an underspending mind. Abandoning without reserve all the desires born of sankalpa, and completely restraining the whole group of senses by the mind from all sides, little by little let him attain to quietude by the intellect held firmly, having made the mind establish itself in the self, let him not think of anything. From whatever cause the restless, unsteady mind wanders away, from that let him restrain it and bring it under the control of the self alone. Supreme bliss verily comes to this yogi whose mind is quite peaceful, whose passion is quieted, who has become Brahman, and who is free from sin. The yogi, always engaging the mind thus, in the practice of yoga, freed from sins, easily enjoys the infinite bliss of contact with Brahman, the eternal. With the mind harmonized by yoga he sees the self abiding in all beings and all beings in the self, he sees the same everywhere. He who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, he does not become separated from me nor do I become separated from him. He who, being established in unity, worships me who dwells in all beings that yogi abides in me, whatever may be his mode of living. He who, through the likeness of the self, O Arjuna, sees equality everywhere, be it pleasure or pain, he is regarded as the highest yogi. Arjuna said, this yoga of equanimity taught by thee, O Krishna, I do not see its steady continuance, because of restlessness, of the mind. The mind verily is restless, turbulent, strong, and unyielding, O Krishna. I deem it as difficult to control as to control the wind. The mind ever changes its point of concentration from one object to another. So it is always restless. It is not only restless but also turbulent and impetuous, strong, and obstinate. 
it produces agitation in the body and in the senses. That is why the mind is even more difficult to control than to control the wind. Krishna said, Undoubtedly, O mighty armed Arjuna, the mind is difficult to control and restless, but, by practice and by dispassion it may be restrained. I think that yoga is hard to be attained by one of uncontrolled self, but the self-controlled and striving one attains to it by the, proper, means. Arjuna said, he who is unable to control himself though he has the faith, and whose mind wanders away from yoga, what end does he meet, having failed to attain perfection in yoga, O Krishna? Fallen from both, does he not perish like a rent cloud, supportless, O mighty armed, Krishna, deluded on the path of Brahman? This doubt of mine, O Krishna, do thou completely dispel, because it is not possible for any but thee to dispel this doubt. Krishna said, O Arjuna, neither in this world, nor in the next world is there destruction for him, none, verily, who does good, O my son, ever comes to grief. Having attained to the worlds of the righteous and, having dwelt there for everlasting years, he who fell from yoga is reborn in the house of the pure and wealthy. Or he is born in a family of even the wise yogis, verily a birth like this is very difficult to obtain in this world. There he comes in touch with the knowledge acquired in his former body and strives more than before for perfection, O Arjuna. By that very former practice he is born on in spite of himself. Even he who merely wishes to know yoga transcends the Brahmic word. But, the yogi who strives with assiduity, purified of sins and perfected gradually through many births, reaches the highest goal. The yogi is thought to be superior to the ascetics and even superior to men of knowledge, obtained through the study of scriptures, he is also superior to men of action, therefore, be thou a yogi, O Arjuna. And among all the yogis, he who, full of faith and with his inner self merged in me, worships me, he is deemed by me to be the most devout. Sri Krishna tells Arjuna that the Supreme Godhead has to be realized in both its transcendent and immanent aspects. The yogi who has reached the summit has nothing more to know. This complete union with the Lord is difficult of attainment. Among many thousands of human beings, very few aspire for this union, and even among those who aspire for it, few ever reach the pinnacle of spiritual realization. Krishna says that whatever exists is nothing but himself. He is the cause of the appearance of the universe and all things in it. Everything is strung on him like clusters of gems on a string. He is the essence, substance and substratum of everything, whether visible or invisible. Although everything is in him, yet he transcends everything as the actionless self. Property or nature is made up of the three gunas or qualities satway, rajas and tamas. These three qualities delude the soul and make it forget its true nature, which is one with God. This delusion, termed Maya, can only be removed by the grace of the Lord Himself. Krishna said, O Arjuna, hear how you shall without doubt know me fully, with the mind intent on me, practicing yoga and taking refuge in me. If you sing the glories and attributes of the Lord, you will develop love for Him and then your mind will be ever fixed on Him. Intense love for the Lord is real devotion. With this you must surely get full knowledge of the Self. I shall declare to thee in full this knowledge combined with direct realization, after knowing which nothing more here remains to be known. Among thousands of men, one perchance strives for perfection, even among those successful strives, only one perchance knows me in essence. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intellect, and egoism thus is my nature divided eightfold. This is the inferior property, O mighty armed, Arjuna. Know thou as different from it my higher property, nature, the very life element by which this world is upheld. Know that these two, my higher and lower natures, are the womb of all beings. So, I am the source and dissolution of the whole universe. There is nothing whatsoever higher than me, O Arjuna. All this is strung on me as clusters of gems on a string. There is no other cause of the universe but me. I alone am the cause of the universe. I am the sappy deity in water, O Arjuna. I am the light in the moon and the sun, 
I am the syllable OM in all the Vedas, sound in ether, and virility in men. I am the sweet fragrance in earth and the brilliance in fire, the life in all beings, and I am austerity in ascetics. Know me, O Arjuna, as the eternal seed of all beings, I am the intelligence of the intelligent, the splendour of the splendid objects am I. Of the strong, I am the strength devoid of desire and attachment, and in, all, beings, I am the desire unopposed to Dharma, O Arjuna. Whatever being, and objects, that are pure, active, and inert, know that they proceed from me. They are in me, yet I am not in them. Deluded by these natures, states or things, composed of the three qualities of nature, all this world does not know me as distinct from them and immutable. Verily this divine illusion of mine made up of the qualities, of nature, is difficult to cross over, those who take refuge in me alone cross over this illusion. The evildoers and the deluded, who are the lowest of men, do not seek me, they whose knowledge is destroyed by illusion follow the ways of demons. Four kinds of virtuous men worship me, O Arjuna. They are the distressed, the seeker of knowledge, the seeker of wealth, and the wise, O Lord of the Bharatas. Of them, the wise, ever steadfast and devoted to the one, excels, is the best, for, I am exceedingly dear to the wise and he is dear to me. Noble indeed are all these, but I deem the wise man as my very self, for, steadfast in mind, he is established in me alone as the supreme goal. At the end of many births the wise man comes to me, realizing that all this is Vasudev, the innermost self, such a great soul, Mahatma, is very hard to find. Those whose wisdom has been rent away by this or that desire, go to other gods, following this or that right, led by their own nature. Whatsoever form any devotee desires to worship with faith that, same, faith of his I make firm and unflinching. Endowed with that faith, he engages in the worship of that, form, and from it he obtains his desire, these being verily ordained by me, alone. Verily the reward, fruit, that accrues to those men of small intelligence is finite. The worshippers of the gods go to them, but my devotees come to me. The foolish think of me, the unmanifest, as having manifestation, knowing not my higher, immutable and most excellent nature. I am not manifest to all, as I am, being veiled by the Yogamaya. This deluded world does not know me, the unborn and imperishable. I know, O Arjuna, the beings of the past, the present and the future, but no one knows me. By the delusion of the pairs of opposites arising from desire and aversion, O Bharata, all beings are subject to delusion at birth, O Parantapa. But those men of virtuous deeds whose sins have come to an end, and who are freed from the delusion of the pairs of opposites, worship me, steadfast in their vows. Those who strive for liberation from old age and death, taking refuge in me, realize in full that Brahman, the whole knowledge of the self and all action. Those who know me with the Adhibhuta, pertaining to the elements, the Adhideva, pertaining to the gods, and Adiyajana, pertaining to the sacrifice, know me even at the time of death, steadfast in mind. They who are steadfast in mind, who have taken refuge in me, who know me as knowledge of elements on the physical plane, as knowledge of gods on the celestial or mental plane, as knowledge of sacrifice in the realm of sacrifice, they are not affected by death. Beyond all things manifest and unmanifest, beyond these names and forms, there is the Supreme Being Brahman. He indwells this body as the center of all things, including even our own self, individual soul. We are a spiritual being residing in this body and supported by the silent witness within the Supreme Antaryaman. Property or nature is the being pertaining to the elements. Worship, prayer, and offering to the gods with faith and devotion constitute actions that lead to blessedness. The secret of reaching the divine being and thus freeing oneself forever from birth and death and the pains and sufferings of this earth life, is to constantly practice unbroken remembrance of the Lord at all times, in all places and even amidst one's daily activities. If one practices such steady remembrance through regular daily sadhana, 
then he will be rooted in his remembrance even at the time of departing from this body at death. Thus departing, he will go beyond darkness and bondage and attain the realm of eternal blessedness. One must practice sense control. The senses must be well disciplined and gradually withdrawn from outside objects. The mind should be centered within upon God, by uttering O.M. or any divine name. By such steady practice daily the Lord is easily attained. Arjuna said, What is that Brahman? What is it Hyatma? What is action, O best among men? What is declared to be Adhibhuda? And what is it Hideva said to be? Who and how is Adiyajana here in this body, O destroyer of Madhu, Krishna? And how, at the time of death, art thou to be known by the self-controlled one? In the last two verses of the seventh discourse, Krishna uses certain philosophical terms. Arjuna does not understand their meaning. So he proceeds to question the Lord. Krishna said, Brahman is the imperishable, the supreme, his essential nature is called self-knowledge, the offering, to the gods, which causes existence and manifestation of beings and which also sustains them is called action. Adhibhuta, knowledge of the elements, pertains to my perishable nature, and the Purusha or soul is the Adhideva, I alone am the Adiyajana here in this body, O best among the embodied, men. And whosoever, leaving the body, goes forth remembering me alone at the time of death, he attains my being, there is no doubt about this. Whosoever at the end leaves the body, thinking of any being, to that being only does he go, O son of Kunthi, Arjuna, because of his constant thought of that being. The most prominent thought of one's life occupies the mind at the time of death. It determines the nature of the body to be attained in the next birth. Therefore, at all times remember me only and fight. With mind and intellect fixed, or absorbed, in me, thou shalt doubtless come to me alone. With the mind not moving towards any other thing, made steadfast by the method of habitual meditation, and constantly meditating, one goes to the Supreme Person, the Resplendent, O Arjuna. Whosoever meditates on the Omniscient, the Ancient, the Ruler, of the whole world, minute than an atom, the supporter of all, of inconceivable form, effulgent like the sun and beyond the darkness of ignorance, at the time of death, with unshaken mind, endowed with devotion and by the power of yoga, fixing the whole life breath in the middle of the two eyebrows, he reaches that resplendent supreme person. That which is declared imperishable by those who know the Vedas, that which the goal I will declare to thee in brief. Having closed all the gates, confine the mind in the heart and fix the life breath in the head, engaged in the practice of concentration, uttering the monosyllable O.M. the Brahman remembering me always, he who departs thus, leaving the body, attains to the supreme goal. I am easily attainable by that ever steadfast yogi who constantly and daily remembers me, for a long time, not thinking of anything else, with a single or one-pointed mind, Oparth constantly remembering the Lord throughout one's life is the easiest way of attaining him. Having attained me these great souls do not again take birth, here, which is the place of pain and is non-eternal, they have reached the highest perfection, liberation. All, the worlds, including the world of Brahma, are subject to return again, O Arjuna. But he who reaches me, O son of Kunthi, has no rebirth. Those who know the day of Brahma, which is of a duration of a thousand yugas, ages, and the night, which is also of a thousand yugas duration, they know day and night. From the unmanifested all the manifested, worlds, proceed at the coming of the day, at the coming of the night they dissolve verily into that alone which is called the unmanifested. Coming of the day is the commencement of creation. Coming of the night is the commencement of dissolution. This same multitude of beings, born again and again, is dissolved, helplessly, O Arjuna, into the unmanifested, at the coming of the night, and comes forth at the coming of the day. But verily there exists, higher than the unmanifested, another unmanifested eternal who is not destroyed when all beings are destroyed. Another unmanifested eternal refers to Parabrahman, which is distinct from the unmanifested, primordial nature, and which is of quite a different nature. 
it is superior to Hiranyagarbha, the creative intelligence, and the unmanifested nature because it is their cause. It is not destroyed when all beings from Brahma down to a blade of grass are destroyed. What is called the unmanifested and the imperishable, that they say is the highest goal, path. They who reach it do not return, to this cycle of births and deaths. That is my highest abode, place or state. That highest Purusha, O Arjuna, is attainable by unswerving devotion to him alone within whom all beings dwell and by whom all this is pervaded. Now I will tell thee, O chief of the Bharatas, the times departing at which the yogis will return or not return. Fire, light, daytime, the bright fortnight, the six months of the northern path of the sun, northern solstice, departing then, by these, men who know Brahman go to Brahman. Attaining to the lunar light by smoke, night time, the dark fortnight or the six months of the southern path of the sun, the southern solstice, the yogi returns. The bright and the dark paths of the world are verily thought to be eternal, by the one, the bright path, a person goes not to return, and by the other, the dark path, he returns. The bright path is the path to the gods taken by devotees. The dark path is of the manes taken by those who perform sacrifices or charitable acts with the expectation of rewards. Knowing these paths, O Arjuna, no yogi is deluded. Therefore, at all times be steadfast in yoga. Whatever fruits or merits is declared, in the scriptures, to accrue from, the study of, the Vedas, the performance of, sacrifices, the practice of, austerities, and, the offering of, gifts beyond all these goes the yogi, having known this, and he attains to the supreme primeval, first or ancient, abode. Observing that Arjuna was a qualified aspirant and endowed with faith, Krishna declares to him the sovereign knowledge and sovereign secret that is to be known by direct experience. He adds that without faith in this knowledge man fails to reach God and is reborn to suffer. Now the Lord proceeds to describe his nature as the eternal, all-comprehensive truth. He is everything that is invisible and visible. He pervades everything that exists. He creates everything, sustains everything, and when final dissolution takes place, absorbs everything into himself. He manifests them again when the next creation begins. All beings who are ignorant of this knowledge are caught helplessly in the cycle of birth and death. In the midst of this creation, preservation, and dissolution of the universe, the Lord stands as a silent witness, unaffected and unattached. He is the sole director, sustained and supervisor of his cosmic property. Krishna said, I shall now declare to thee who does not cavil, the greatest secret, the knowledge combined with experience, self-realization. Having known this, thou shalt be free from evil. This is the kingly science, the kingly secret, the supreme purifier, realizable by direct intuitional knowledge, according to righteousness, very easy to perform and imperishable. Those who have no faith in this dharma, knowledge of the self, O Arjuna, return to the path of this world of death without attaining me. All this world is pervaded by me in my unmanifest aspect, all beings exist in me, but I do not dwell in them. Nor do beings exist in me, in reality behold my divine yoga, supporting all beings, but not dwelling in them, is myself, the efficient cause of beings. As the mighty wind, moving everywhere, rests always in the ether, even so, know thou that all beings rest in me. All beings, O Arjuna, enter my nature at the end of a kalpa, I send them forth again at the beginning of, the next, kalpa. Animating my nature, I again and again send forth all this multitude of beings, helpless by the force of nature. These actions do not bind me, O Arjuna, sitting like one indifferent, unattached to those acts. Under me as supervisor, nature produces the moving and the unmoving, because of this, O Arjuna, the world revolves. Fools disregard me, clad in human form, not knowing my higher being as the great lord of, all, beings. Fools who do not have discrimination despise me, dwelling in human form. I have taken this body to bless my devotees. 
these fools have no knowledge of my higher being. I am the great Lord, the Supreme. Of vain hopes, of vain actions, of vain knowledge and senseless, they verily are possessed of the deceitful nature of demons and indivine beings. But the great souls, O Arjuna, partaking of my divine nature, worship me with a single mind, with the mind devoted to nothing else, knowing me as the imperishable source of beings. Always glorifying me, striving, firm in vows, prostrating before me, they worship me with devotion, ever steadfast. Others also, sacrificing with the wisdom sacrifice, worship me, the all-faced, as one, as distinct, and as manifold. I am the Kratu, I am the Yajna, I am the offering, food, to the manis, I am the medicinal herb and all the plants, I am the mantra, I am also the ghee or melted butter, I am the fire, I am the ablation. I am the father of this world, the mother, the dispenser of the fruits of actions, and the I am the goal, the support, the Lord, the witness, the abode, the shelter, the friend, the rig dash, the Sama and Yajur Vedas. I am the goal, the support, the Lord, the witness, the abode, the shelter, the friend, the origin, the dissolution, the foundation, the treasure house and the imperishable seed. As the sun, I give heat, I withhold and send forth the rain, I am immortality and also death, existence and non-existence, O Arjuna. The knowers of the three Vedas, the drinkers of Soma, purified of all sins, worshipping me by sacrifices, pray for the way to heaven, they reach the holy world of the Lord of the Gods and enjoy in heaven the divine pleasures of the Gods. They, having enjoyed the vast heaven, enter the world of mortals when their merits are exhausted, thus, abiding by the injunctions of the three, Vedas, and desiring, objects of, desires, they attain to the state of going and returning. When their accumulated merits are exhausted, they come to this world again. They have no independence. To those men who worship me alone, thinking of no other, of those ever united, I secure what is not already possessed and preserve what they already possess. Even those devotees who, endowed with faith, worship other gods, worship me only, O Arjuna, but by the wrong method. For, I alone am the enjoyer and also the lord of all sacrifices, but they do not know me in essence, in reality, and hence they fall, return to this mortal world. The worshippers of the gods go to them, to the manis go the ancestor worshippers, to the deities who preside over the elements go their worshippers, my devotees come to me. Whoever offers me with devotion and a pure mind, heart, a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or a little water I accept, this offering. Whatever thou do, whatever thou eat, whatever thou offer in sacrifice, whatever thou give, whatever thou practiced as austerity, O Arjuna, do it as an offering unto me. Thus, shalt thou be freed from the bonds of actions yielding good and evil fruits, with the mind steadfast in the yoga of renunciation, and liberated, thou shalt come unto me. The same am I to all beings, to me there is none hateful or dear, but those who worship me with devotion are in me and I am also in them. Even if the most sinful worships me, with devotion to no one else, he too should indeed be regarded as righteous, for he has rightly resolved. Soon he becomes righteous and attains to eternal peace, O Arjuna, know thou for certain that my devotee is never destroyed. For, taking refuge in me, they also, who, O Arjuna, may be of sinful birth women, Vaishas as well as Sudras attain the supreme goal. How much more easily than the holy Brahmins and devoted royal saints, attain the goal, having obtained this impermanent and unhappy world, do thou worship me. Fix thy mind on me, be devoted to me, sacrifice unto me, bow down to me, having thus united thy whole self with me, taking me as the supreme goal, thou shalt verily come unto me. The whole being of a man should be surrendered to the Lord without reservation. Then there will be a marvelous transformation. He will have the vision of God everywhere. All sorrows and pains will vanish. His mind will be one with him. He will forever have his life and being in the Lord alone. 
Krishna tells Arjuna that even the devas and highly evolved souls fail to understand how he projects himself as the universe and all its manifestations. He goes on to describe the various qualities that beings manifest according to their karmas. All these qualities wisdom, truth, contentment, etc. originate from him. The true devotees of the Lord are wholly absorbed in him. They have completely surrendered to him and through single-minded devotion they are granted the power of discrimination, the discrimination that leads them from the unreal to the real. Krishna emphatically declares that ignorance is destroyed, and knowledge gained through divine grace alone. Arjuna accepts the descent of the Supreme in a human form, but wishes to know from the Lord himself his cosmic powers by means of which he controls the diverse forces of the universe. The Lord describes his divine glories, bringing within the range of Arjuna's comprehension his limitless manifestations, and how he upholds everything. In short, the Lord is the almighty power that creates, sustains, and destroys everything. Krishna said, again, O mighty armed Arjuna, listen to my supreme word which I shall declare to thee who art beloved, for thy welfare. The all-compassionate Lord in his mercy wants to encourage Arjuna and cheer him up, and so he himself comes forward to give him instructions without any request having been made by Arjuna. Neither the hosts of the gods nor the great sages know my origin, for, in every way I am the source of all the gods and the great sages. He who knows me as unborn and beginningless, as the great lord of the worlds, he, among mortals, is undeluded, he is liberated from all sins. As the supreme being is the cause of all the worlds, he is beginningless. As he is the source of all the gods and the great sages, so there is no source for his own existence. As he is beginningless, he is unborn. He is the great lord of all the worlds. Intellect wisdom, non-delusion, forgiveness, truth, self-restraint, calmness, happiness, pain, birth or existence, death or non-existence, fear and also fearlessness, different kinds of qualities of beings arise from me alone. The seven great sages, the ancient four and also the manas, possessed of powers like me, on account of their minds being fixed on me, were born of, my, mind, from them are these creatures born in this world. He who in truth knows these manifold manifestations of my being and, this, I am the source of all, from me everything evolves, understanding thus, the wise, yoga power of mind becomes established in the unshakable yoga, there is no doubt about it. I am the source of all, from me everything evolves, understanding thus, the wise, endowed with meditation, worship me with their minds and lives entirely absorbed in me, enlightening each other and always speaking of me, they are satisfied and delighted. To them who are ever steadfast, worshipping me with love, I give the yoga of discrimination by which they come to me. The devotees who have dedicated themselves to the Lord, who are ever harmonious and self-abiding, who adore him with intense love, who are ever devout, obtain the divine grace. Out of mere compassion for them, I dwelling within their self, destroy the darkness born of ignorance by the luminous lamp of knowledge. Arjuna said, Thou art the supreme Brahman, the supreme abode, or the supreme light, the supreme purifier, the eternal, divine person, the primeval God, unborn and omnipresent. All the sages have thus declared thee, as also the divine sage Narada, so also, Asita, Devala and Vyasa, and now thou thyself sayest so to me. I believe all this that thou sayest to me as true, O Krishna. Verily, O blessed Lord, neither the gods nor the demons know thy manifestation, origin. Verily, thou thyself knowest thyself by thyself, O supreme person, O source and lord of beings, O god of gods, O ruler of the world. Thou shouldst indeed tell, without reserve of thy divine glories by which thou existest, pervading all these worlds. No one else can do so. How shall I, ever meditating, know thee, O Yogin? In what aspects or things, O blessed Lord, art thou to be thought of by me? Tell me again in detail, O Krishna, of thy yogic power and glory, 
for I am not satisfied with what I have heard of thy life-giving and nectar-like speech. Krishan said, Very well, now I will declare to thee my divine glories in their prominence, O Arjuna. There is no end to their detailed description. I am the Self, O Gudakesha, seated in the hearts of all beings. I am the beginning, the middle, and also the end of all beings. Among the, twelve, Adityas, I am Vishnu, among the luminaries, the radiant sun, I am Marishi among the, seven or forty-nine, Marats, among stars the moon am I. Among the Vedas I am the Sama Veda, I am Vasva among the gods, among the senses I am the mind, and I am intelligence among living beings. And, among the Rudras I am Shankara, among the Yakshas and Rakshasas, the Lord of Wealth, Kubra, among the Vasus I am Pavaka, Fire, and among the, seven, mountains I am the Meru. And, among the household priests, of kings, O Arjuna, know me to be the chief, Brihaspati, among the army generals I am Skunda, among lakes I am the ocean. Among the great sages I am Bragu, among words I am the monosyllable OM, among sacrifices I am the sacrifice of silent repetition, among immovable things the Himalayas I am. Repetition of the mantra is regarded as the best of all yajanas or sacrifices. There is no loss or injury in this yajana. Manu says, whatever else the Brahmana may or may not do, he attains salvation by japa alone. Among the trees, I am, the people, among the divine sages I am Narada, among Gandharvs I am Chitrarada, among the perfected the sage Kapala. Know me as Ukiyas Ravas, born of nectar among horses, among lordly elephants, I am, the Aravada, and among men, the king. Among weapons I am the thunderbolt, among cows I am the wish-fulfilling cow called Surbi, I am the progenitor, the god of love, among serpents I am Vasuki. I am Ananta among the Nagas, I am Varana among water deities, Aryaman among the Manis I am, I am Yama among the governors. And, I am Prahlad among the demons, among the reckoners I am time, among beasts I am their king, the lion, and Garuda among birds. Among the purifiers, or the speeders, I am the wind, Rama among the warriors am I, among the fishes I am the shark, among the streams I am the Gunga. Among creations I am the beginning, the middle, and the end, O Arjuna. Among the sciences I am the science of the self, and I am logic among controversialists. Among the letters of the alphabet, the letter A I am, and the dual among the compounds. I am verily the inexhaustible or everlasting time, I am the dispenser, of the fruits of actions, having faces in all directions. And I am all devouring death, and prosperity of those who are to be prosperous, among feminine qualities, I am, fame, prosperity, speech, memory, intelligence, firmness, and forgiveness. Among the hymns also I am the Brihatsaman, among meters Gayatri am I, among the months I am Margasirsa, among seasons, I am, the flowery season. I am the gambling of the fraudulent, I am the splendour of the splendid, I am victory, I am determination, of those who are determined, I am the goodness of the good. Of the various methods of defrauding others, I am gambling, such as dice play. Gambling is my manifestation. I am power in the powerful. I am victory in the victorious. I am effort in those who make that effort. Among Vrishnas I am Vasudev, among the Pandavas I am Arjuna, among sages I am Vyasa, among poets I am Usana, the poet. Among the punishers I am the scepter, among those who seek victory I am and whatever is the seed of all beings, that also am I, O Arjuna. There is no being, whether moving or unmoving, that can exist without me. I am the primeval seed from which all creation has come into existence. I am the seed of everything. I am the self of everything. Nothing can exist without me everything is of my nature. I am the soul of everything. There is no end to my divine glories, O Arjuna, but this is a brief statement by me of the particulars of my divine glories. Whatever being there is that is glorious, prosperous, or powerful, that know thou to be a manifestation of a part of my splendour. 
But of what avail to thee is the knowledge of all these details, O Arjuna? I exist, supporting this whole world by one part of myself. By this explanation of the highest secret concerning the self, which thou hast spoken out of compassion towards me my delusion is gone. After hearing the glories of the Lord, Arjuna has an intense longing to have the wonderful cosmic vision. The origin and the destruction of beings verily have been heard by me in detail from thee, O Lotus-eyed Lord, and also thy inexhaustible greatness. Now, O Supreme Lord, as thou hast thus described thyself, O Supreme Person, I wish to see thy divine form. If thou, O Lord, thinks it possible for me to see it, do thou, then, O Lord of the Yogis, show me thy imperishable self. Krishna said, Behold, O Arjuna, my forms by the hundreds and thousands, of different sorts, divine, and of various colors and shapes. Behold the Adityas, the Vasus, the Rudras, the two Asvins and also the Maruts, behold many wonders never seen before, O Arjuna. Now behold, O Arjuna, in this, my body, the whole universe centered in the one including the moving and the unmoving and whatever else thou desires to see. But thou art not able to behold me with these, thine own eyes, I give thee the divine eye, behold my lordly yoga. No fleshy eye can behold me in my cosmic form. One can see me only through the eye of intuition or the divine eye. It should not be confused with seeing through the physical eye or through the mind. It is an inner divine experience attained through intense devotion and concentration. Sanjaya said, having thus spoken, O King, the great Lord of Yoga, Hari, Krishna, showed to Arjuna his supreme form as the Lord. With numerous mouths and eyes, with numerous wonderful sights, with numerous divine ornaments, with numerous divine weapons uplifted, such a form he showed. Wearing divine garlands and apparel, anointed with divine unguents, the all-wonderful, resplendent, being, endless, with faces on all sides, if the splendor of a thousand suns were to blaze out at once, simultaneously, in the sky, that would be the splendor of that mighty being, great soul. There, in the body of the god of gods, Arjuna then saw the whole universe resting in the one, with its many groups. Then, Arjuna, filled with wonder and with hair standing on end, bowed down his head to the Lord and spoke with joined palms. I behold all the gods, O God, in thy body, and hosts of various classes of beings, Brahma, the Lord, seated on the lotus, all the sages and the celestial serpents. I see thee of boundless form on every side, with many arms, stomachs, mouths and eyes, neither the end nor the middle nor also the beginning do I see, O Lord of the Universe, O Cosmic Form. I see thee with the diadem, the club, and the discus, a mass of radiance shining everywhere, very hard to look at, blazing all round like burning fire and the sun, and immeasurable. Thou art the imperishable, the supreme being, worthy of being known, thou art the great treasure house of this universe, thou art the imperishable protector of the eternal dharma, thou art the ancient person, I deem. I see thee without beginning, middle, or end, infinite in power, of endless arms, the sun and the moon being thy eyes, the burning fire thy mouth, heating the entire universe with thy radiance. The space between the earth and the heaven and all the quarters are filled by thee alone, having seen this, thy wonderful and terrible form, the three worlds are trembling with fear, O great soul being. Verily, into thee enter these hosts of gods, some extol thee in fear with joined palms, may it be well. Saying thus, bands of great sages and perfected ones praise thee with complete hymns. The Rudras, Adityas, Vasus, Sathyas, Visvidavas, the two Asvins, Maruts, the Manis, and hosts of celestial singers, Yakshas, demons and the perfected ones, are all looking at thee in great astonishment. Having beheld thy immeasurable form with many mouths and eyes, O mighty armed, with many arms, thighs, and feet, with many stomachs, and fearful with many teeth, the worlds are terrified and so am I. On seeing thee, the cosmic form, touching the sky, shining in many colors, with mouths wide open, with large, fiery eyes, 
I am terrified at heart and find neither courage nor peace, O Vishnu. Having seen thy mouths, fearful with teeth, blazing like the fires of cosmic dissolution, I know not the four quarters, nor do I find peace. Have mercy, O Lord of the gods. O abode of the universe. All the sons of Dhritarashtra with the hosts of kings of the earth, Bhishma, Drona, and Karna, with the chief among all our warriors, they hurriedly enter into thy mouths with terrible teeth and fearful to behold. Some are found sticking in the gaps between the teeth, with their heads crushed to powder. Verily, just as many torrents of rivers flow towards the ocean, even so these heroes of the world of men enter thy flaming mouths. As moths hurriedly rush into a blazing fire for, their own, destruction, so also these creatures hurriedly rush into thy mouths for, their own, destruction. Thou lick up, devouring all the worlds on every side with thy flaming mouths. Thy fierce rays, filling the whole world with radiance, are burning, O Vishnu. Tell me, who thou art, so fierce in form. Salutations to thee, O God Supreme. Have mercy, I desire to know thee, the original being. I know not indeed thy doing. Krishna said, I am the mighty world destroying time, now engaged in destroying the worlds. Even without thee, none of the warriors arrayed in the hostile armies shall live. Therefore, stand up and obtain fame. Conquer the enemies and enjoy the unrivaled kingdom. Verily, they have already been slain by me, be thou a mere instrument, O Arjuna. Drona, Bhishma, Jayadratha, Karna, and all the other courageous warriors these have already been slain by me, do thou kill, be not distressed with fear, fight and thou shalt conquer thy enemies in battle. Sanjaya said, having heard that speech of Lord Krishna, the crowned one, Arjuna, with joined palms, trembling, prostrating himself, again addressed Krishna, in a choked voice, bowing down, overwhelmed with fear. Arjuna said, It is meet, O Krishna, that the world delights and rejoices in thy praise, demons fly in fear to all quarters and the hosts of the perfected ones bow to thee. And why should they not, O great soul, bow to thee who art greater, than all else, the primal cause even of, Brahma, the creator, O infinite being. O Lord of the gods. O abode of the universe. Thou art the imperishable, the being, the non-being and that which is the supreme, that which is beyond the being and non-being. Thou art the primal god, the ancient Purusha, the supreme refuge of this universe, the knower, the knowable and the supreme abode. By thee is the universe pervaded, O being of infinite forms. Thou art Vayu, Yama, Agni, Varana, the moon, the creator, and the great grandfather. Salutations, salutations unto thee, a thousand times, and again salutations, salutations unto thee. Salutations to thee from front and from behind. Salutations to thee on every side. O all! Thou infinite in power and prowess, pervades all, wherefore thou art all. Whatever I have presumptuously uttered from love or carelessness, addressing thee as O Krishna. O friend! Regarding thee merely as a friend, unknowing of this, thy greatness, in whatever way I may have insulted thee for the sake of fun while at play, reposing, sitting or at meals, when alone, with thee, O Krishna, or in company that I implore thee, immeasurable one, to forgive. Thou art the father of this world, unmoving and moving. Thou art to be adored by this world. Thou art the greatest guru, for, none there exists who is equal to thee, how then can there be another superior to thee in the three worlds, O being of unequalled power? Therefore, bowing down, prostrating my body, I crave thy forgiveness, O adorable Lord. As a father forgives his son, a friend his, dear, friend, a lover his beloved, even so should thou forgive me, O God. I am delighted, having seen what has never been seen before, and yet my mind is distressed with fear. Show me that, previous, form only, O God. Have mercy, O God of gods. O abode of the universe. I desire to see thee as before, crowned, 
bearing a mace, with the discus in hand, in thy former form only, having four arms, O thousand armed, cosmic form, being. Krishna said, O Arjuna, this cosmic form has graciously been shown to thee by me by my own yogic power, full of splendor, primeval, and infinite, this cosmic form of mine has never been seen before by anyone other than thyself. Neither by the study of the Vedas and sacrifices, nor by gifts, nor by rituals, nor by severe austerities, can I be seen in this form in the world of men by any other than thyself, O great hero of the Kurus, Arjuna. Be not afraid nor bewildered on seeing such a terrible form of mine as this, with thy fear entirely dispelled and with a gladdened heart, now behold again this former form of mine. Sanjaya said, having thus spoken to Arjuna, Krishna again showed his own form, and the great soul, Krishna, assuming his gentle form, consoled him who was terrified, Arjuna. Arjuna said, having seen this thy gentle human form, O Krishna, now I am composed and restored to my own nature. Krishna said, very hard indeed it is to see this form of mine which thou hast seen. Even the gods are ever longing to behold it. Neither by the Vedas, nor by austerity, nor by gift, nor by sacrifice, can I be seen in this form as thou hast seen me, so easily. But by single-minded devotion can I, of this form, be known and seen in reality and also entered into, O Arjuna. He who does all actions for me, who looks upon me as the supreme, who is devoted to me, who is free from attachment, who bears enmity towards no creature, he comes to me, O Arjuna. Arjuna said, Those devotees who, ever steadfast, thus worship thee and those also who worship the imperishable and the unmanifested which of them are better versed in yoga? Krishna said, Those who, fixing their minds on me, worship me, ever steadfast and endowed with supreme faith, these are the best in yoga in my opinion. Those who worship the imperishable, the indefinable, the unmanifested, the omnipresent, the unthinkable, the eternal, and the immovable, having restrained all the senses, even-minded everywhere, intent on the welfare of all beings verily they also come unto me. Greater is their trouble whose minds are set on the unmanifested, for the goal the unmanifested is very difficult for the embodied to reach. But to those who worship me, renouncing all actions in me, regarding me as the supreme goal, meditating on me with single-minded yoga, to those whose minds are set on me, O Arjuna, verily I become ere long the savior out of the ocean of the mortal samsara. Fix thy mind on me only, thy intellect in me, then, thou shall no doubt live in me alone hereafter. If thou art unable to fix thy mind steadily on me, then by the yoga of constant practice do thou seek to reach me, O Arjuna. If thou art unable to practice even this Abhyasa Yoga, be thou intent on doing actions for my sake, even by doing actions for my sake, thou shalt attain perfection. If thou art unable to do even this, then, taking refuge in union with me, renounce the fruits of all actions with the self-controlled. Better indeed is knowledge than practice, than knowledge meditation is better, than meditation the renunciation of the fruits of actions, peace immediately follows renunciation. He who hates no creature, who is friendly and compassionate to all, who is free from attachment and egoism, balanced in pleasure and pain, and forgiving, ever content, steady in meditation, possessed of firm conviction, self-controlled, with mind and intellect dedicated to me, he, my devotee, is dear to me. He by whom the world is not agitated and who cannot be agitated by the world, and who is freed from joy, envy, fear, and anxiety he is dear to me. He who is free from wants, pure, expert, unconcerned, and untroubled, renouncing all undertakings or commencements he who is, thus, devoted to me, is dear to me. He who neither rejoices, nor hates, nor grieves, nor desires, renouncing good and evil, and who is full of devotion, is dear to me. He who is the same to foe and friend, and in honor and disianur, who is the same in cold and heat and in pleasure and pain, who is free from attachment, he to whom censure, and praise are equal, who is silent, content with anything, homeless, of a steady mind, 
and full of devotion that man is dear to me. They verily who follow this immortal dharma, doctrine or law, as described above, endowed with faith, regarding me as their supreme goal, they, the devotees, are exceedingly dear to me. Arjuna said, I wish to learn about nature, matter, and the spirit, soul, the field, and the knower of the field, knowledge and that which ought to be known. Krishna said, This body, O Arjuna, is called the field, he who knows it is called the knower of the field by those who know of them, that is, by the sages. Do thou also know me as the knower of the field in all fields, O Arjuna? Knowledge of both the field and the knower of the field is considered by me to be the knowledge. What the field is and of what nature, what its modifications are and whence it is, and also who he is and what his powers are here all that from me in brief. Sages have sung in many ways, in various distinctive chants and also in the suggestive words indicative of the absolute, full of reasoning and decisive. The great elements, egoism, intellect, and also unmanifested nature, the ten senses and one, and the five objects of the senses, desire, hatred, pleasure, pain, the aggregate, the body, fortitude, and intelligence the field has thus been described briefly with its modifications. Humility, unpretentiousness, non-injury, forgiveness, uprightness, service of the teacher, purity, steadfastness, self-control, indifference to the objects of the senses, also absence of egoism, perception of, or reflection on, the evil in birth, death, old age, sickness, and pain, non-attachment, non-identification of the self with son, wife, home, and the rest, and constant even-mindedness on the attainment of the desirable and the undesirable, unswerving devotion unto me by the yoga of non-separation, resort to solitary places, distaste for the society of men, constancy in self-knowledge, perception of the end of true knowledge this is declared to be knowledge, and what is opposed to it is ignorance. I will declare that which has to be known, knowing which one attains to immortality, the beginningless supreme Brahman, called neither being nor non-being. With hands and feet everywhere, with eyes, heads and mouths everywhere, with ears everywhere, he exists in the worlds, enveloping all. Shining by the functions of all the senses, yet without the senses, unattached, yet supporting all, devoid of qualities, yet their experiencer, without and within, all, beings, the unmoving and also the moving, because of his subtlety, unknowable, and near and far away is that. And undivided, yet he exists as if divided in beings, he is to be known as the supporter of beings, he devours, and he generates also. That, the light of all lights, is beyond darkness, it is said to be knowledge, the knowable and the goal of knowledge, seated in the hearts of all. Thus the field as well as knowledge and the knowable have been briefly stated. My devotee, knowing this, enters into my being. Know thou that nature and spirit are beginningless, and know also that all modifications and qualities are born of nature. In the production of the effect and the cause, nature, matter, is said to be the cause, in the experience of pleasure and pain, the soul is said to be the cause. The soul seated in nature experiences the qualities born of nature, attachment to the qualities is the cause of his birth in good and evil wombs. The supreme soul in this body is also called the spectator, the permitter, the supporter, the enjoyer, the great lord and the supreme self. He who thus knows spirit and matter, together with the qualities, in whatever condition he may be, he is not reborn. Some by meditation behold the self in the self by the self, others by the yoga of knowledge, and others by the yoga of action. Others also, not knowing thus, worship, having heard of it from others, they, too, cross beyond death, regarding what they have heard as the supreme refuge. Wherever a being is born, whether it be unmoving or moving, know thou, O best of the Bharatas, Arjuna, that it is from the union between the field and its knower. He sees, who sees the Supreme Lord, existing equally in all beings, the unperishing within the perishing. Because he who sees the same Lord dwelling equally everywhere does not destroy the self by the self, he goes to the highest goal. He sees,
who sees that all actions are performed by nature alone and that the self is actionless. When a man sees the whole variety of beings as resting in the one, and spreading forth from that alone, he then becomes Brahman. Being without beginning and devoid of, any, qualities, the Supreme Self, imperishable, though dwelling in the body, O Arjuna, neither acts, nor is tainted. As the all-pervading ether is not tainted because of its subtlety, so the self seated everywhere in the body, is not tainted. Just as the one sun illumines the whole world, so also the lord of the field, the supreme self, illumines the whole field, O Arjuna. They who, through the eye of knowledge, perceive the distinction between the field and its knower, and also the liberation from the nature of being, they go to the supreme. Krishna said, I will again declare, to thee, that supreme knowledge, the best of all knowledge, having known which all the sages have gone to the supreme perfection after this life. They who, having taken refuge in this knowledge, attain to unity with me, are neither born at the time of creation nor are they disturbed at the time of dissolution. My womb is the great Brahma, in that I place the germ, thence O Arjuna, is the birth of all beings. Whatever forms are produced, O Arjuna, in any womb whatsoever, the great Brahma is their womb and I am the seed-giving father. Purity, passion, and inertia these qualities, O mighty armed Arjuna, born of nature, bind fast in the body, the embodied, the indestructible. Of these, Satwe, which from its stainlessness is luminous and healthy, binds by attachment to knowledge and to happiness, O sinless one. Know thou Rajas to be of the nature of passion, the source of thirst, for sensual enjoyment, and attachment, it binds fast, O Arjuna, the embodied one by attachment to action. But know thou Thomas to be born of ignorance, deluding all embodied beings, it binds fast, O Arjuna, by heedlessness, sleep and indolence. Satwe attaches to happiness, Rajas to action, O Arjuna, while Thomas, shrouding knowledge attaches to heedlessness only. Now Satwe prevails, O Arjuna, having overpowered Rajas and Tamas, now Rajas, having overpowered Satwe and Tamas, and now Tamas, having overpowered Satwe and Rajas. When, through every gate, sense, in this body, the wisdom light shines, then it may be known that Satwe is predominant. Greed, activity, the undertaking of actions, restlessness, longing these arise when Rajas is predominant, O Arjuna. Darkness, inertness, heedlessness, and delusion these arise when Tamas is predominant, O Arjuna. If the embodied one meets with death when Satwe has become predominant, then he attains to the spotless worlds of the knowers of the highest. Meeting death in Rajas, he is born among those who are attached to action, and dying in Tamas, he is born in the womb of the senseless. The fruit of good action, they say, is Satwik and pure, the fruit of Rajas is pain, and ignorance is the fruit of Tamas. From Satwe arises knowledge, and greed from Rajas, heedlessness and delusion arise from Tamas, and ignorance also. Those who are seated in Satwe proceed upwards, the Rajasic dwell in the middle, and the Tamasic, abiding in the function of the lowest Gunna, go downwards. When the seer beholds no agent other than the Gunas, knowing that which is higher than them, he attains to my being. The embodied one, having crossed beyond these three gunas out of which the body is evolved, is freed from birth, death, decay, and pain, and attains to immortality. Arjuna said, What are the marks of him who has crossed over the three qualities, O Lord? What is his conduct and how does he go beyond these three qualities? Light, activity, and delusion when they are present, O Arjuna, he hates not, nor does he long for them when they are absent. He who, seated like one unconcerned, is not moved by the qualities, and who, knowing that the qualities are active, is self-centered and moves not, alike in pleasure and pain, who dwells in the self, to whom a clod of earth, stone, and gold are alike, to whom the deer and the unfriendly are alike, firm, the same in censure and praise, the same in honor and disianur, the same to friend and foe, abandoning all undertakings he is said to have crossed the qualities. And he who serves me with unswerving devotion, 
he, crossing beyond the qualities, is fit for becoming Brahman. For I am the abode of Brahman, the immortal and the immutable, of everlasting Dharma and of absolute bliss. Krishna said, they, the wise, speak of the indestructible people tree, having its root above and branches below, whose leaves are the meters or hymns, he who knows it is a knower of the Vedas. Below and above spread its branches, nourished by the gunas, sense objects are its buds. And below in the world of men stretch forth the roots, originating action. Its form is not perceived here as such, neither its end nor its origin, nor its foundation nor resting place, having cut asunder this firmly rooted people tree with the strong axe of non-attachment, then that goal should be sought after, whither having gone none returns again. Seek refuge in that primeval Purusha whence streamed forth the ancient activity or energy. Free from pride and delusion, victorious over the evil of attachment, dwelling constantly in the self, their desires having completely turned away, freed from the pairs of opposites known as pleasure and pain, the undiluted reach the eternal goal. Neither doth the sun illuminate there, nor the moon, nor the fire, having gone thither they return not, that is my supreme abode. An eternal portion of myself having become a living soul in the world of life, draws to, itself, the, five, senses with the mind for the sixth, abiding in nature. When the Bhagavan obtains a body and when he leaves it, he takes these and goes, with them, as the wind takes the scents from their seats, flowers, etc. Presiding over the ear, the eye, touch, taste, and smell, as well as the mind, he enjoys the objects of the senses. The deluded do not see him who departs, stays, and enjoys, but they who possess the eye of knowledge behold him. The yogis striving, for perfection, behold him dwelling in the self, but, the unrefined and unintelligent, even those striving, see him not. That light which residing in the sun, illumines the whole world, that which is in the moon and in the fire know that light to be mine. Permeating the earth I support all beings by, my, energy, and, having become the watery moon, I nourish all herbs. Having become the fire vice venara, I abide in the body of living beings and, associated with the prana and apana, digest the fourfold food. And, I am seated in the hearts of all, from me are memory, knowledge, as well as their absence. I am verily that which has to be known by all the Vedas, I am indeed the author of the Vedanta, and the knower of the Vedas am I. Two Purushas there are in this world, the perishable and the imperishable. All beings are the perishable, and the Kyutastha is called the imperishable. But distinct is the supreme Purusha called the highest self, the indestructible Lord who, pervading the three worlds, sustains them. As I transcend the perishable and am even higher than the imperishable, I am declared as the highest Purusha in the world and in the Vedas. He who, undelude, knows me thus as the highest Purusha, he, knowing all, worships me with his whole being, heart, O Arjuna. Thus, this most secret science has been taught by me, O sinless one. On knowing this, a man becomes wise, and all his duties are accomplished, O Arjuna. Krishna said, Fearlessness, purity of heart, steadfastness in yoga and knowledge, almsgiving, control of the senses, sacrifice, study of scriptures, austerity and straightforwardness, harmlessness, truth, absence of anger, renunciation, peacefulness, absence of crookedness, compassion towards beings, covetousness, gentleness, modesty, absence of fickleness, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, purity, absence of hatred, absence of pride these belong to one born in a divine state, O. Oh. Arjuna. Hypocrisy, arrogance, self-conceit, harshness and also anger and ignorance, belong to one who is born in a demoniacal state, O oh Arjuna. The divine nature is deemed for liberation and the demoniacal for bondage. Grieve not, O Arjuna, for thou art born with divine properties. There are two types of beings in this world the divine and the demoniacal, the divine has been described at length, hear from me, O Arjuna, of the demoniacal. 
the demoniacal know not what to do and what to refrain from, neither purity nor right conduct nor truth is found in them. They say, this universe is without truth, without a, moral, basis, without a god, brought about by mutual union, with lust for its cause, what else? Holding this view, these ruined souls of small intellects and fierce deeds, come forth as enemies of the world for its destruction. Filled with insatiable desires, full of hypocrisy, pride, and arrogance, holding evil ideas through delusion, they work with impure resolves. Giving themselves over to immeasurable cares ending only with death, regarding gratification of lust as their highest aim, and feeling sure that that is all, bound by a hundred ties of hope, given over to lust and anger, they strive to obtain by unlawful means hoard of wealth for sensual enjoyment. This has been gained by me today, this desire I shall obtain, this is mine and this wealth too shall be mine in future. That enemy has been slain by me and others also I shall slay. I am the Bhagavan, I enjoy, I am perfect, powerful, and happy. I am rich and born in a noble family. Who else is equal to me? I will sacrifice. I will give, charity. I will rejoice, thus, deluded by ignorance, bewildered by many a fancy, entangled in the snare of delusion, addicted to the gratification of lust, they fall into a foul hell. Self-conceited, stubborn, filled with the intoxication and pride of wealth, they perform sacrifices in name, through ostentation, contrary to scriptural ordinances. Given over to egoism, power, haughtiness, lust, and anger, these malicious people hate me in their own bodies and those of others. These cruel haters, the worst among men in the world I hurl all these evildoers forever into the wombs of demons only. Entering into demoniacal wombs and deluded birth after birth, not attaining me, they thus fall, O Arjuna, into a condition still lower than that. Triple is the gate of this hell, destructive of the self-lust, anger, and greed therefore, one should abandon these three. A man who is liberated from these three gates to darkness, O Arjuna, practices what is good for him and thus goes to the supreme goal. He who, casting aside the ordinances of the scriptures, acts under the impulse of desire, attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme goal. Therefore, let the scripture be the authority in determining what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. Having known what is said in the ordinance of the scriptures, thou should act here in this world. Those who, setting aside the ordinances of the scriptures, perform sacrifice with faith, what is their condition, O Krishna? Is it that of Satwe, Rajas, or Thomas? Threefold is the faith of the embodied, which is inherent in their nature the Satwik, pure, the Rajasic, passionate, and the Tamasic, dark. Do thou hear of it? The faith of each is in accordance with his nature, O Arjuna. The man consists of his faith, as a man's faith is, so is he. The Satwik or pure men worship the gods, the Rajasic or the passionate worship the Akshas and the Rakshasas, the others, the Tamasic or the deluded, worship the ghosts and the hosts of nature spirits. Those men who practice terrific austerities not enjoined by the scriptures, given to hypocrisy and egoism, impelled by the force of lust and attachment, senseless, torturing all the elements in the body and me also, who dwells in the body, know thou these to be of demoniacal resolves. The food also which is dear to each is threefold, as also sacrifice, austerity and almsgiving. Hear thou the distinction of these. Foods which increase life, purity, strength, health, joy, and cheerfulness, which are oleaginous and savory, substantial, and agreeable, are dear to the Satwik people. The foods that are bitter, sour, saline, excessively hot, dry, pungent, and burning, are liked by the Rajasic and are productive of pain, grief, and disease. That which is stale, tasteless, putrid, rotten, and impure refuse, is the food liked by the Tamasic. That sacrifice which is offered by men without desire for reward as enjoined by the ordinance, scripture, with a firm faith that to do so is a duty, is satwik, or pure. The sacrifice which is offered, O Arjuna, seeking a reward and for ostentation, know thou that to be a Rajasikyajana. 
they declare that sacrifice to be tamasic which is contrary to the ordinances of the scriptures, in which no food is distributed, which is devoid of mantras and gifts, and which is devoid of faith. Worship of the gods, the twice-born, the teachers and the wise, purity, straightforwardness, celibacy and non-injury these are called the austerities of the body. Speech which causes no excitement and is truthful, pleasant and beneficial, the practice of the study of the Vedas, are called austerity of speech. Serenity of mind, good-heartedness, purity of nature, self-control this is called mental austerity. This threefold austerity practiced by steadfast men with the utmost faith, desiring no reward, they call satvik. The austerity which is practiced with the object of gaining good reception, honor and worship and with hypocrisy, is here said to be rajasic, unstable and transitory. The austerity which is practiced out of a foolish notion, with self-torture, or for the purpose of destroying another, is declared to be tamasic. That gift which is given to one who does nothing in return, knowing it to be a duty to give in a fit place and time to a worthy person, that gift is held to be satvik. And, that gift which is made with a view to receive something in return, or looking for a reward, or given reluctantly, is said to be rajasic. The gift which is given at the wrong place and time to unworthy persons, without respect, or with insult, is declared to be tamasic. O M Tat Sat, this has been declared to be the triple designation of Brahman. By that were created formerly the Brahmanas, the Vedas, and the sacrifices. Therefore, with the utterance of OM are the acts of gift, sacrifice and austerity as enjoined in the scriptures always begun by the students of Brahman. Uttering Tat, without aiming at the fruits, are the acts of sacrifice and austerity and the various acts of gift performed by the seekers of liberation. The word Sat is used in the sense of reality and of goodness, and so also, O Arjuna, it is used in the sense of an auspicious act. Steadfastness in sacrifice, austerity, and gift, is also called sat, and also action in connection with these, or for the sake of the supreme, is called Saturday. Whatever is sacrificed, given, or performed, and whatever austerity is practiced without faith, it is called a sat, O Arjuna. It is not here or hereafter, after death. Arjuna said, I desire to know severally, O mighty armed, the essence or truth of renunciation, O Hrishiksa, as also of abandonment, O slayer of Kesi. Krishna said, The sages understand sunyas to be the renunciation of action with desire, the wise declare the abandonment of the fruits of all actions as taiga. Some philosophers declare that all actions should be abandoned as an evil, while others declare that acts of gift, Sacrifice and austerity should not be relinquished. Hear from me the conclusion or the final truth about this abandonment, O best of the Bharatas, abandonment, verily, O best of men, has been declared to be of three kinds. Acts of sacrifice, gift, and austerity should not be abandoned, but should be performed. Sacrifice, gift and also austerity are the purifiers of the wise. But even these actions should be performed leaving aside attachment and the desire for rewards, O Arjuna. This is my certain and best conviction. Verily, the renunciation of obligatory action is improper, the abandonment of the same from delusion is declared to be tamasic. He who abandons action on account of the fear of bodily trouble, because it is painful, he does not obtain the merit of renunciation by doing such rajasic renunciation. Whatever obligatory action is done, O Arjuna, merely because it ought to be done, abandoning attachment and also the desire for reward, that renunciation is regarded as satvik. The man of renunciation, pervaded by purity, intelligent and with his doubts cut asunder, does not hate a disagreeable work nor is he attached to an agreeable one. Verily, it is not possible for an embodied being to abandon actions entirely, but he who relinquishes the rewards of actions is verily called a man of renunciation. The threefold fruit of action evil, good, and mixed accrues after death to the non-abandoners, but never to the abandoners. Learn from me, O mighty armed Arjuna, these five causes, as declared in the Sankhya system for the accomplishment of all actions. The body, 
the doer, the various senses, the different functions of various sorts, and the presiding deity, also, the fifth, whatever action a man performs by his body, speech, and mind, whether right or the reverse, these five are its causes. Now, such being the case, he who, owing to untrained understanding, looks upon his self, which is isolated, as the agent, he of perverted intelligence, sees not. He who is ever free from the egoistic notion, whose intelligence is not tainted by, good or evil, though he slays these people, he slayed not, nor is he bound, by the action. Knowledge, the knowable and the knower form the threefold impulse to action, the organ, the action, and the agent form the threefold basis of action. Knowledge, action, and the actor are declared in the science of the Gunas, the Sankhya philosophy, to be of three kinds only, according to the distinction of the Gunas. Hear them also duly. That by which one sees the one indestructible reality in all beings, not separate in all the separate beings know thou that knowledge to be satvic, pure. But that knowledge which sees in all beings various entities of distinct kinds as different from one another know thou that knowledge to be rajasic, passionate. But that which clings to one single effect as if it were the whole, without reason, without foundation in truth, and trivial that is declared to be tamasic, dark. An action which is ordained, which is free from attachment, which is done without love or hatred by one who is not desirous of any reward that action is declared to be satvic. But that action which is done by one longing for the fulfillment of desires or gain, with egoism, or with much effort that is declared to be rajasic. That action, which is undertaken from delusion, without regard to the consequences of loss, injury and, one's own, ability that is declared to be tamasic. He who is free from attachment, non-egoistic, endowed with firmness and enthusiasm and unaffected by success or failure, is called satvic. Passionate, desiring to obtain the rewards of actions, cruel, greedy, impure, moved by joy and sorrow, such an agent is said to be rajasic. Unsteady, dejected, unbending, cheating, malicious, vulgar, lazy and procrastinating such an agent is called tamasic. Hear thou the threefold division of the intellect and firmness according to the gunas, as I declare them fully and distinctly, O Arjuna. That which knows the path of work and renunciation, what ought to be done and what ought not to be done, fear and fearlessness, bondage and liberation that intellect is satvic, O Arjuna. That by which one incorrectly understands dharma and adharma, and also what ought to be done and what ought not to be done that intellect, O Arjuna, is rajasic. That which, enveloped in darkness, views adharma as dharma and all things perverted that intellect, O Arjuna, is called tamasic. The unwavering firmness by which, through yoga, the functions of the mind, the life force and the senses are restrained that firmness, O Arjuna, is satvic. But that firmness, O Arjuna, by which, on account of attachment and desire for reward, one holds fast to dharma, enjoyment of pleasures and earning of wealth that firmness, O Arjuna, is rajasic. That by which a stupid man does not abandon sleep, fear, grief, despair, and also conceit that firmness, O Arjuna, is tamasic. Now hear from me, O Arjuna, of the threefold pleasure, in which one rejoices by practice and surely comes to the end of pain. That which is like poison at first but in the end like nectar that pleasure is declared to be satvic, born of the purity of one's own mind due to self-realization. That pleasure which arises from the contact of the sense organs with the objects, which is at first like nectar and in the end like poison that is declared to be rajasic. That pleasure which at first and in the sequel is delusive of the self, arising from sleep, indolence, and heedlessness such a pleasure is declared to be tamasic. There is no being on earth or again in heaven among the gods that is liberated from the three qualities born of nature. Of Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, as also the Sudras, O Arjuna, the duties are distributed according to the qualities born of their own nature. Serenity, self-restraint, austerity, purity, forgiveness and also uprightness, knowledge, realization, and belief in God are the duties of the Brahmanas, born of, their own, nature. 
prowess, splendor, firmness, dexterity, and also not fleeing from battle, generosity and lordliness are the duties of Kshatriyas, born of, their own, nature. Agriculture, cattle rearing, and trade are the duties of the Vaishya, merchant class, born of, their own, nature, and action consisting of service is the duty of the Sudra, servant class, born of, their own, nature. Each man, devoted to his own duty, attains perfection. How he attains perfection while being engaged in his own duty, here now. He from whom all the beings have evolved and by whom all this is pervaded, worshipping him with his own duty, man attains perfection. Better is one's own duty, though, destitute of merits, than the duty of another well performed. He who does the duty ordained by his own nature incurs no sin. One should not abandon, O Arjuna, the duty to which one is born, though faulty, for, all undertakings are enveloped by evil, as fire by smoke. He whose intellect is unattached everywhere, who has subdued his self, from whom desire has fled he by renunciation attains the supreme state of freedom from action. Learn from me in brief, O Arjuna, how he who has attained perfection reaches Brahman, that supreme state of knowledge. Endowed with a pure intellect, controlling the self by firmness, relinquishing sound and other objects and abandoning both hatred and attraction, dwelling in solitude, eating but little, with speech, body and mind subdued, always engaged in concentration and meditation, taking refuge in dispassion, having abandoned egoism, strength, arrogance, anger, desire, and covetousness, free from the notion of mine and peaceful, he is fit for becoming Brahman. Becoming Brahman, serene in the self, he neither grieves nor desires, the same to all beings, he attains supreme devotion unto me. By devotion he knows me in truth, what and who I am, and knowing me in truth, he forthwith enters the supreme. Doing all actions always, taking refuge in me, by my grace he obtains the eternal, indestructible state or abode. Mentally renouncing all actions in me, having me as the highest goal, resorting to the yoga of discrimination do thou ever fix thy mind on me. Fixing thy mind on me, thou shalt by my grace overcome all obstacles, but if from egoism thou wilt not hear me, thou shalt perish. If, filled with egoism, thou think, I will not fight, vain is this, thy resolve, nature will compel thee. O Arjuna, bound by thy own karma, action, born of thy own nature, that which from delusion thou wish not to do, even that thou shalt do helplessly. The Lord dwells in the hearts of all beings, O Arjuna, causing all beings, by his elusive power, to revolve as if mounted on a machine. Fly unto him for refuge with all thy being, O Arjuna. By his grace thou shalt obtain supreme peace and the eternal abode. Thus has wisdom more secret than secrecy itself been declared unto thee by me, having reflected over it fully, then act thou as thou wish. Hear thou again my supreme word, most secret of all, because thou art dearly beloved of me, I will tell thee what is good. Fix thy mind on me, be devoted to me, sacrifice to me, bow down to me thou shalt come even to me, truly do I promise unto thee, for, thou art dear to me. Abandoning all duties, take refuge in me alone, I will liberate thee from all sins, grieve not. This is never to be spoken by thee to one who is devoid of austerities, to one who is not devoted, nor to one who does not render service, nor who does not desire to listen, nor to one who cavils at me. He who with supreme devotion to me will teach the supreme secret to my devotees, shall doubtless come to me. Nor is there any among men who does dearer service to me, nor shall there be another on earth dearer to me than he. And he who will study this sacred dialogue of ours, by him I shall have been worshipped by the sacrifice of wisdom, such is my conviction. The man also who hears this, full of faith and free from malice, he, too, liberated, shall attain to the happy worlds of those of righteous deeds. Has this been heard, O Arjuna, with one-pointed mind? Has the delusion of thy ignorance been fully destroyed, O Dhananjaya? Arjuna said, Destroyed is my delusion as I have gained my memory, knowledge, 
through thy grace, O Krishna. I am firm, my doubts are gone. I will act according to thy word. Sanjaya said, Thus have I heard this wonderful dialogue between Krishna and the high-souled Arjuna, which causes the hair to stand on end. Through the grace of Vyasa I have heard the supreme and most secret yoga direct from Krishna, the Bhagavan of Yoga himself declaring it. O King, remembering this wonderful and holy dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, I rejoice again and again. And remembering again and again also that most wonderful form of Hari, great is my wonder, O King. And I rejoice again and again. Wherever there is Krishna, the Bhagavan of Yoga, wherever there is Arjuna, the archer, there are prosperity, happiness, victory, and firm policy, such is my conviction. <laughs>